Aloha, Chair. This is live. You have the floor. Good morning, everyone. This is the September 21, 2021 meeting of the Commission on Water Resource Management. Thank you for joining us here. Um, it's 9, uh, I believe it's 9.02 a.m. Yeah. Um, Let me just read uh, today's the, the standard contested case statement for today. In some of the matters before the commission, a person may wish to request a contested case hearing. If such a request is made before the commission's decision, then the commission will consider the request first before considering the merits of the item before it. A person who wants a contested case may also wait until the commission decides the issue, then request the contested case after the decision. It's up to you. Any request must be made orally by the end of the meeting and followed up in writing within 10 days. If no request for contested case is made, the commission will make a decision and the department will treat the decision as final and proceed accordingly. We're holding this meeting today via Zoom um, due to the ongoing pandemic um, and broadcasting it live stream for a general public um, to be able to watch. Persons who have signed up to uh, testify are in the waiting room. We will let you in to the Zoom meeting when your item is up. A reminder to please, when you come into the meeting, turn off your YouTube because otherwise we will get an echo. And when you're in the waiting room, please make sure that your computer identifies you by name uh, for, for the purposes of, of us knowing uh, which item you're there for in the waiting room. And uh, preferably by name and agenda item, that would be simplest. Um, I think that's it. Um, first up on the agenda is item A, approval of the minutes of the August 17, 2021 meeting. All commissioners were at that meeting. Um, there, there's no public testimony on the minutes. Um, commissioners, any comments on the minutes as drafted? No comments. Okay, then is there a motion to approve the minutes as submitted? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so that's a unanimous vote today. Case, Meyer, Kagawa, Viviani, Sito, Buck, Katayama, and Hannes. Okay, next up is item B1. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Chair, if we can, let's make sure we get everyone for B1 into the room before proceeding. Thank you. All right, hang on a second. Let me let me just make sure we have everyone. And Rayanne, if you could help me with that. Thank you. We're good, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. Please proceed. All right, B1. Okay, uh, so everyone should be able to see the presentation view. Yes. Um, and again, good morning. Uh, Dean Ueno with the Commission's uh, Stream Protection and Management Branch. Uh, with me is Aaron Strouk, uh, also with the Commission Stream Protection and Management Branch. Um, so we just want to give you a very high overview of uh, the status of the Waikapu Intermediate Stream Flow Standard uh, compliance, as well as water availab availability issues uh, on the South Waikapu Kuliana Awai. And this is specifically for the Waikapu uh, Surface Water Hydrologic Unit in Mawaeha, Maui. Let's see, sorry, I'm trying to between a couple of screens here. Uh, so yeah, just a chronology. First off, we're going to talk about the Intermediate Stream Flow Standard. Um, so back in April 2014, the Waikapu uh, Interim IFS was uh, established through mediation at 2.9 MGD. Um, as of about December 2017, Commission installed a uh, continuous Waikapu, uh, continuous gauge on Waikapu stream at the 915 foot elevation. 
uh, and that was uh, soon upgraded to a real-time station so that data is available online. Um, on October 20th, uh, excuse me, October 2020, uh, the commission received a complaint from the HUI, uh, HUI Onova Eha, that uh, there was a violation of the interim instrument flow standard for Waikapu, uh, Wailuku, and Wahei rivers. And so we followed that up in December, uh, we forwarded that response, or excuse me, the complaint uh, to Wailuku Water Company seeking a response from them, uh, which we did receive. And again, I'm not gonna get into the details of, of um, the specifics of the, the complaint and the response. Um, again, this is just a high overview. And so I'm gonna turn it over to, at this point to uh, Dr. Aaron Strauch to talk about the instrument flow standard. Good morning, commissioners. Dr. Aaron Strauch uh, with the Stream Protection Management Branch. Uh, I'm just gonna give you uh, some overview of recent rainfall conditions. As you are well aware, uh, Maui has been in uh, somewhat of a long-term drought. Uh, before you is the total monthly rainfall measured on um, Pu Kukui uh, for each of each month for each of the last four years, with the long-term average monthly rainfall uh, on in black. And as you can see, for the most part, every single month has been below the long-term average in total rainfall. Uh, Dean, go forward. This is. Uh, led to a uh, long-term deficit in um, groundwater recharge and therefore base flow to streams uh, forward. Um, we have been monitoring the stream flow in Waikapu below the South Waikapu ditch intake since 2014, uh, but in 20, I think it was 2016, a uh, flood wiped out our lower uh, gauging station. So we reinstalled it up at the 915 foot elevation. And then uh, shortly thereafter, we added real time gauging to provide uh, a little bit more transparency. Um, it, the station is challenging to maintain. Uh, post flood, there's been a lot of material moving through the stream channel, like uh, similar to Waik uh, Wailuku river, uh, but we've been measuring quite consistently to maintain uh, an accurate rating curve and um, improve monitoring. We've also been monitoring how much is being um, withdrawn at, uh, concurrently during our flow measurements uh, via the uh, partial flume that Wailuka Water Company installed um, measuring the flow into uh, reservoir number one. Forward. Uh, the real-time monitoring is available online. Uh, it's not perfect, but it does provide, uh, especially um, as, as we update the rating curve with uh, our periodic measurements, it, it does provide accurate data. Forward, Dean. Um, these are all of our measurements since 2019. Um, we have a pretty good rating curve as long as the stream channel doesn't change. As you can see, we've had some substantial shifts with um, high flow events. Um, over the last couple of years, but uh, generally we haven't had too many big flow events uh, forward, Dean. Um, this is uh, our nearest index station at the moment is on Wailuku River. And as you can see, the, the blue line is the median flow, the Q50 flow, the red line is the Q90 flow. Um, and so at this Wailuku River station, you can identify locations where we just have substantial uh, uh, declines in stream flow related to climate. Uh, next, Dean. This is the Waikapu stream gauging station for um, mean daily flow for 2020 and 2021. Um, and you can see, especially in 2020, there were a lot of days when the IIFS was not being met. But again, this is um, uh, related to uh, both a decline in rainfall as well as um, trying to meet the off-stream uses uh, with, you know, we're in the middle of the contested case and um, there were some challenges in operating the system. Um, forward. Um, forward, we just saw that, it's okay. 
So as I mentioned, um, Reservoir 1 monitoring is currently at the outflow of the South Waikapu Ditch um, at this partial flume. Next, Dean. Um, just immediately above that flume is this um, gate, which uh, was used historically to release water into uh, the what's called the South Waikapu Awai. Um, and that gate was uh, damaged in 2020 because of a lack of flow into the LY. Um, however, the, um, and then Wailuka Water Company repaired it. Um, there was additional damage. It's been repaired as well um, a second time forward, Dean. Um, we are proposing to add uh, monitoring on South Waikapu LY before the gate so that um, the, the flow diverted out of uh, Waikapu can be monitored um, before any distribution points. And this is the old, um, sorry, Dean, go back. This is the old uh, um, Stilling Well monitoring station that the plantation used. You can see there's still a staff plate in the well. That's it. All right, so um, next we want to get into a chronology of the South Waikapu, the issues on the South Waikapu LY. Um, so in October 2020, we, um, it was reported that Wailuku Water Company had installed a new valve on the, um, the pipe that releases water into the South Waikapu LY uh, from Reservoir 1. And I'll get into, a, I'll have some pictures of uh, a little bit later. Uh, we also, at, shortly thereafter, we also received reports that the South Waikapu Kuleana Awai users were not receiving uh, sufficient amounts of water, if any at all. And so, um, and again, as Aaron noted, we were in the middle of the contest case hearing, and so uh, we we're trying to figure out how much, exactly how much water they were receiving, as you folks are aware. Um, in June of 2021, uh, Wailuku Water Company contacted the staff regarding the drought conditions, as Aaron noted. Uh, seeking to seeking emergency relief to increase the diversion from Waikapu stream. Uh, that request was followed up with a letter from Chair Case uh, denying that request. And then in July 2021, um, Wailuku Water Company began to report vandalism of the emergency control gate that Aaron just showed uh, from Reservoir 1 to uh, release more water into the South Waikapu LY. Me, my on. Um, so in August 2021, Wailuku Water again reported uh, vandalism, that it was continuing, um, and that they would instead um, replace that wooden uh, release gate. Um, they, that they would shut down the, the ditch flow and install a um, hollow tile wall in place of that wooden release gate uh, to seal off additional releases to the South Waikapu LY. Uh, letters were sent to Wailuku Water Company and South Waikapu, and at this point, the, the decision and order had been issued from the commission. And so we took this as an opportunity just to um, make sure that the users as well as Wailuku Water Company were aware of the, some of the, the terms that we had put in the, um, that you folks had put in the decision and order. Um, subsequently, we received a complaint from Wailuku, uh, excuse me, from the Hui. Um, again, regarding the lack of water in the South Waikapu Awai. And this is a formal complaint uh, that was filed. Uh, that was on August 11th, I believe. There was some back and forth. Um, uh, supposedly, um, the Hui had sent it earlier, but we didn't receive it via email. And so we finally got it in hand on August 11th. Um, so that complaint was forwarded to Wailuku Water Company for response. Uh, we also forwarded the complaint to the users, um, the certain other users on the system. So uh, Clayton Suzuki was... Um, the, was one of them. And we asked for specific details on how he gauges his water use. Um, how does he share uh, his water use with, Awai, with the other Awai users and the allegations of water quality issues that were raised in the complaint. And I'll get into this a little bit later. And then on September, uh, we forwarded the complaint to Waikapu Properties as well. Um, there were certain things that were identified in the decision order, um, as such as you see there. Um, they mentioned that they were, they were working towards organic crop certification of Kumu Farms so that the, the water allocation could be reduced just for cattle. Um, and then there were also the issue of, um, based on that, 
um, that they would reduce the supply, the drinking water supply to, to the cattle at, uh, to the rate of uh, 250 gallons per acre per day. And then there was also the point of relocating all the uh, Kumu Farms' farming operations uh, to areas Makai of Wahei Ditch, that it would no longer rely on the water from Reservoir 1. Um, as of now, we are um, that response from Waikapu Properties is still pending. I think the deadline was today for a response. Uh, we did receive a response to the complaint from Wailuku Water Company, as well as um, if we did receive information from uh, Clayton Suzuki, and um, we'll get to that a little bit later as well. Uh, so just to show you the conditions on Reservoir 1, um, the photo at the top left is from February 22nd of this year, and uh, the photos in the lower, um, in the, the other photos are, for, are of the reservoir. Uh, the reservoir is divided kind of into two sections. There's a, a mouth, uh, I guess, a, uh, north and a south section. And you can see here that the water trickles in from the north section um, and it, it primarily uh, fills up the southern portion of the reservoir. Uh, so this is just a diagram, uh, South Waikapu Awai as we knew it. Um, and this is what is included or taken from the decision, decision and order. Yeah, so we should all be familiar with this. Um, but there are some details that the HUI provided in their complaint that they filed um, that differ slightly. And so um, this is again from their, their complaint that we received in August. And so you can see that from the dam on Waikapu stream, it goes into the South Waikapu ditch. Uh, there is the return flow um, in order for Wailuku Water Company to meet the IFS that's been established. Um, and so there's this bypass that this gate that we've been talking about um, which is just before entering the reservoir. Uh, previously, previously, again, it was a wooden gate that they would use to release water. Um, and norm typically this would be if there was excess water um, that they would release into the South Waikapu Kuleana Awai. And I guess um, in previous years, they have been releasing water um, by that way. But with the drought conditions, um, Wailuku Water Company tend to solely release water from the, um, the Kuleana intake or this pipe that was released from the reservoir. And so eventually, again, this wooden gate was replaced with a hollow tile wall. And so the water from Reservoir 1 should be feeding um, solely Waikapu properties. Um, and then the water in the South Waikapu, uh, Kulana Awai, goes down, down the hill for a considerable distance. Um, and so the first person on, off of that, that Awai is uh, Clayton Suzuki. Um, and he was issued a permit for 10,850 gallons per day. And as you note, um, as you can see here, the, uh, the Hui did note that there was a traditional Awai that was formerly took water directly from the, uh, directly from Waikapu stream um, and brought it into the Awai where it would feed the further downstream users. Um, as you can see here, Ka'ili Pono, um, his permit was denied. Um, and then you have Makimoto, the new, um, the new landowners, Brad Harder. Um, and then there's Alves, Smythe, Higa, and Kamasaki. And you can see that the whole E here uh, turned back to like a poo stream. Uh, so these are just some of the points that we outlined in the letters to like uh, Wailuku Water Company and the Kuliana Awa users uh, from the decision order. Um, I won't go over all these in detail, but basically the conditions of the permit um, that to Wailuku Water Company was that they would continue continuously monitor um, these points. So the diversion to the South Waikapu Ditch at Reservoir 1 um, and the distribution to the South Waikapu Awai. Uh, we also asked them to ensure that the quantity of water um, was based on the surface water use permits. And so this is the amount there, the uh, 265,000 uh, gallons per day. Um, and then also the management of the Kuliana systems. And this is specifically towards, directed towards Oiluku Water Company and Mahi, Mahipono. Um, that they are responsible to maintain their ditches to the point of delivery, and then as well as monitoring uh, to the points of diversion, to the points of um, distribution uh, to the Kuliana systems. And then this is more for the Awai users. Um, it's just speaking towards the, to the, um, uh, the award of water uh, for Lo'ikalo that they ensure that the, um, the Awai are sufficient to handle the flows. I mean, so this just speaks to the maintenance of the Awai, really. Um, and then um, encouraging Awai users to um, collectively steward the Awai systems. Uh, again, further, uh, 
advising the Kulani users that especially in uh, uh, you know and this is a particular this is brought up right in some of the in our discussions um, for some of these uh, why that are unlined in particular um, so South Waikapu as you can see there's no that if they could uh, work towards improving system efficiencies that included um, alternatives such as lining or piping the why um, and then we talk towards um, just more management right of the um, management and maintenance of the systems here in 20 in uh, 210 and then uh, 211 <clears throat> again um, working with the um, working with others um, <clears throat> to maintain the LY. And then 212 and 213, um, working, having a, having kind of um, making sure that people take ownership of the, um, the LY and manage it. Um, and, and so then this is the, this is the table that was provided, um, kind of just summarizes all the users or the surface water use permits that were issued uh, to receive water specifically from Reservoir 1 uh, in Waikapu. Um, again, this table was compiled by um, the HUI um, and submitted as part of their complaint. And so uh, you can just see here that the total uh, that should be is about 267,026 gallons per day uh, from the reservoir. So getting to the, uh, this is the release or the distribution point from reservoir one into the South Waikapu Awai. Um, this photos, these photos were provided by the HUI in their complaint. Uh, this is the uh, just a photo of the the uh, pipe into the LY. Um, in 2019, there was no valve um, and lock. <clears throat> and so part of the complaint was that in October 2020, where Luka Water Company installed this new valve here um, and installed a lock on it. And again, you can see it in uh, seven, uh, July 2021. And so uh, part of the complaint includes the issue that Waikapu Properties um, has the lowest priority for cattle in this, in this situation, um, yet they received their water before um, any of the other Kuleana users because they are receiving their water directly from Reservoir 1. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And so it was brought up that if the surface water use permit is only for um, 1,638 GPD um, for Waikapu Properties to, um, provide for their drinking water for cattle, uh, do they need to continue filling up the reservoir for that purpose? Um, is there a more efficient way uh, to get the water to the users instead of um, putting it into the reservoir, which is unlined, uh, which may result in, in loss? Uh, getting specifically to Clayton Suzuki's, um, the issue about Clayton Suzuki, his intake is located about uh, just under half a mile above all the other Kuleana users, as, as you saw in the diagram. Um, and so there are concerns raised about um, if Clayton Suzuki is able to take more water than his permit allows. Uh, and part of this was addressed in his, uh, we did raise this question to him um, in his, uh, in our letter to him. And he responded that uh, he, he has basically has a timer on, um, on his valves. And so uh, he, he, he controls it in that sense. If he's not using the water, it's not being taken um, into, in, through, into his intake. Uh, but uh, Mr. Su Suzuki does also employ uh, the use of sand filters. And so part of the use of sand filters is that as, it, um, as the water filters through it, especially surface water, um, it filters out all the, the sediment, the debris, the leaves and all that. And at, every so often you need to back flush it. And so in Mr. Suzuki's case, um, he back flushes that water back into the AOI. And so there are uh, issues with water quality concerns, um, particularly the sand and that sediment that goes back into the AOI and then it continues on to the downstream users. And so this is a photo of the um, Mr. Suzuki's intake um, within the Kulian AOI. Uh, so, and uh, just to, to note on the, the photo on the bottom right is a photo of that, um, that hollow tile wall that replaced the wooden uh, control gate on the, um, the ditch flowing into, the, into Reservoir 1. Uh, so some of the proposed solutions that uh, the, the HUI raised uh, was to modify the emergency release gate to allow for the, um, 
the permitted water to flow directly into the Kuleana Awai rather than uh, out of the pipe from Reservoir 1. Um, they also advised, um, or excuse me, suggested reducing the take of water into Reservoir 1 um, and providing it directly to Waikapu properties. So basically taking reservoir, the unlined Reservoir 1 out of the equation. Um, and then addressing the take of water by Mr. Suzuki um, and the, the concerns about water quality and the backwash from the sand filters that goes back into the Hawaii. Um, also raised in the complaint was the potential for allowing the Kuleana users to restore the original Awai, which connects directly to Waikapu stream. Um, as we know, as uh, it's noted in the complaint, the original Awai is located currently on lands owned by Waikapu Properties and Makani Olu Ranch, which is um, owned by, uh, which is uh, essentially Avery Chumley, uh, president for Wailuku Water Company. And so there are issues there as well as um, just some elevational issues that would need to be overcome um, if that were, uh, if that were, uh, if that if there was a decision to move forward on that uh, that solution, and I, the, you, you can see the map on the right. Again, this is provided by the Hui as part of their complaint. Um, so the blue line that you see there is the South Waikapu Awai. Um, the yellow line here is essentially where the the traditional Awai flowed directly from Waikapu Stream into the Awai. Um, and that's it for our presentation. And so I just want to open it up to the commission if, uh, for open discussion, if they have any questions. I'll stop sharing at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. It's Ms. Kagawa Viviani. Go ahead. Thanks. I have questions on the presentation. Aaron, um, just just trying to understand um, what was presented. Um, so in May 2020, there was like a major drop. Was that a um, in the data you showed? Of a, is is that? Um, can you just explain that? I'm sure there's a simple answer, but Aaron. I'm pulling up the data, hold on. Okay, I think it was, you know, and when you were showing the, uh, I think it was like a full flow after the Cape Um, Do you want me to bring up the screen? Uh, uh, hold on. And then if you could um, indicate, because I'm quite unfamiliar with this system, like where you're, you mentioned that um, you proposing to add monitoring of self worldwide before the gate. And I just wanted to understand like where on the diagram that was. Um, it's like 50 feet experience. up up the ditch. It's really sorry, sorry. I I've never been there. So like yeah. if you have the, the um yeah uh <clears throat> and I mean from May it's just the lack of rainfall. Um so I just Within wanted to the span add... of two weeks or is that an artifact of the gauging? Uh, I, I just hold on. I just want to add that um, one of the issues we had was enforcement. We didn't have in pre decision and order, there was no drought scenario mechanism to um, enforce whether there was even sufficient water in the stream to meet the IFS, as well as meeting the traditional customary practices or any of the other off stream uses. Um, so we were really in a bind because there was um, a lack of water, not just, you know, in total, there was not sufficient water to meet the IFS on, on in certain days, um, whether it, even if no water was diverted. Um, so, so while, yes, the this flow in the stream was below the IIFS mediated um, in 2014, there was also not like if, if you put all the water that was being diverted back in the stream, it still wouldn't meet the IFS. So we, we weren't sure what to do at that point. <laughs> um, so yeah, is the question, um, was more water being diverted um, in like June, 2020 versus- no, Well, I guess I was just, if you could explain, cause it looks like you basically turn into, there's like a major, shift in May. 
So remember, this is not this is regulated flow. So it's uh, affected by how much water is being withdrawn from the system. Okay, um, and so what so changed right there? I, I I'm not managing the system. I don't. I yeah. Okay. I I don't. I mean, the water goes up and down all the time. I and we just okay. So we don't know. Yeah. We don't know. Okay, that's all I. That's all yep. I was wondering, okay. just to understand the data. And then the other one was, um, where is the proposed monitoring going to be installed? Because if you could just point to it on the diagram, because I'm uh, familiarizing myself. So it's yeah, it's right there. Ah, okay. So there's this bypass um, from the release emergency release gate from the um, South Waikapu ditch that goes into Reservoir One, which is and that was what got concreted, right? Right. And so okay. the yeah, the idea would be to install that gauge uh, just before that. I mean, if you could scroll up to the um, flow into Reservoir One photos, um, keep go up one, two more. All right, so um, on the top left photo here, we're looking at the flow from the um, South Waikapu ditch through the partial flume that's underneath that little bridge into Reservoir One. If you were to turn 90 degrees left, um, uh, scroll down uh, one slide, Dean, um, you would, and then walk a little ways, you would get to this, the, the bottom three photos, um, you, th that's, it's hard. I wish I took like a video. <laughs> I know we need a GoPro and virtual tour. Okay. Um, I, I, I and then, and then from that point, if you, if you went up the ditch another hundred feet, you would get to the, the next slide, Dean, um, right here. And they're really close to each other. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other, other questions? Sure, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Hannes, then Mr. Buck. Yeah, uh, so Reservoir uh, 1 is unlined? Yes. Yes. And um, based on the uh, evidence in the contested case hearing, it leaks about 0.15 MGD when full. So when it's not full, when we don't, you know, we don't have real time monitoring on the reservoir, so we don't know. Um, but based on the, the broadband report submitted as part of the, an exhibit of the, the Wailuku Water Company system, um, it, it loses about 1, 0.15 MGD. And currently, it's only beneficiary or Wailuku properties? And the, the Awai gets, the, gets water. They're at least 267,000 gallons per day from the reservoir through that pipe that's now valved. At, at this point, I believe um, the water is, is still going to Kumu Farm. And so that's why we sent the letter to them. What's the status of um, the organic crop certification, which I believe is supposed to reduce the amount of water that goes to the cattle. Um, and then their relocation of their farming operations, uh, Makai of Waihei Ditch. At that point, they would switch to uh, receiving water from Waihei Ditch um, instead of Reservoir One. So I, what I'm getting at is, is it reasonable to expect the beneficiaries of that reservoir to uh, be called upon to make an investment in creating, uh, installing lining that would make that reservoir more efficient and create less loss? I guess um, other than the Kuleana Awai users, um, the, you know, once the farm operations are relocated, uh, the only Waikapu properties would be the sole, um, sole recipient of the water and it would only be used for cattle drinking water. And so you know, the question goes to its feasibility to um, line the reservoir at that point um, or you know, just feed, feed the Kuleana users as well as the cattle operations uh, directly from the diversion. Okay, I'll wait for some of the other testimony to come out to illuminate these issues. Thank you. Buck. Yeah, uh, real quick, I'd like to hear the testifiers. Dean, so the majority of the water going to the wide ditch is goes into it before reservoir number one. Uh, I'm reacting to the map that was in decision and order versus the 
the, the map that the, 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 the complaint is put. Uh, sorry, the majority of the water goes to the Hawaii before? No, the majority of the water that goes into the South Waikapu Hawaii is diverted before it enters Reservoir 1? No, um, it goes into Reservoir uh, 1 first and then gets distributed out to, so through that pipe that, um, uh, through that pipe, it goes into the reservoir and then it goes into this pipe, which is distributed, drops into the South Waikapu Hawaii. Okay, so the, the, the traffic map that we use for the precision order isn't, isn't accurate. It, it, it shows there is, the, it goes into this, a Y before it enters reservoir number one. Uh, no, it, it's not necessarily inaccurate. It, it just shows it, um, the Awai drops, it drops into the Awai from one end of the reservoir and it feeds the, these uh, Waikapu properties from the other end of the reservoir. So, but it all still goes into the reservoir first. But there was okay. there uh, was that um there was that emergency release gate that was being used. Um, I don't think it was being used all the time, but it was um, intermittent, um, uh, intermittently released into the Awai as well. It's it's supplemental. Yeah, no, based on our so based on our decision and order of the two point nine MGD, at what point were we expecting to be able to measure that? Um, it should have been out of the pipe. Okay. And so keep in mind. And then that. one more quick one. Uh, for, for, for a Waikapu properties, there is no hope. Oh, oh, there is no return to the stream. No. It's all used for agriculture oh, for the cattle. So, Commissioner Buck, the, the 2.9 is the IIFS, right? Correct. I mean, that's. Yeah, that's I understand. I'm trying to just make sure I'm real clear about what point that we were going to measure it to ensure that the uh, there was enough water in, in the Hawaii because that's majority of that water is returned to the stream, uh, uh, which is that's why we set the IFS where at, at two point nine. So and and we measured two point nine in the stream, but um, pre decision in order there was no um, drought scenario. So even if there wasn't sufficient water to meet the two point nine, we didn't have a mechanism to enforce. How much water could be diverted? And actually, the, the two point nine, sorry, the two point nine is um, below the South Waikapu ditch intake. Um, and after there's a there is a release um, from the South Waikapu. Let me go switch to the uh, the Hui's map. There is this release that returns water back um, if there's too much water diverted at the intake because there's no real control um, and it's. Um, not inaccessible, but it's more difficult to access the intake. Um, there is this release flow that returns water back to the stream. And so the IFS point is um, below where this water is returned. And that, that IFS is uh, mainly meant to ensure water to the North Waikapu, um, Awai. Yeah, that was my question. I, I wasn't aware that we're so dependent on the outflow from reservoir number one to to meet our required IFS. And uh, uh, I thought, and even in this, it looks like there is an opportunity to provide that amount of water before the water enters the reservoir. A am I misreading this map? That is one of the proposals um, suggested by the Hui um, in order to ensure that there's more water um, going into the LY. And if, if let's say, that, that was what the final outcome was. The majority of that water is returned to, to the stream. It, it's mostly. Um, I'm not sure how much water is actually returned. There is, um, Aaron, you know the rough distance between the reservoir down to say Clayton's, is it? Uh, Clayton's about, I think it's about a half a mile and then down to the rest of the Kuleana users, it's another quarter to a third of a mile, I think. But so. from the reservoir to Clayton's? It's about half a mile. Oh, is that it? Um, yeah, Maybe so there, 0.6 miles. There is some there is uh, um, some loss because the Awai is unlined. It's it's a fairly steep gradient. There is loss within the Awai, um, and then once it gets down to uh, Mr. Suzuki's intake, um, he takes his first before the Kulana uses, and so um, the water that remains in the Awai continues on down to the Kulana users. And so I'm not exactly sure. I'm not sure if it's in the record how much is. Um, returned back to the stream 
I couldn't say it's a, most of it. I couldn't say that. Okay, uh, why don't we go ahead and hear uh, public testimony on this. Um, and I'm gonna go in uh, the order that people signed up. So first up is Donalyn Fujiwara speaking on behalf of herself and also Crystal Nolani Smythe. Uh, Aloha commissioners. Aloha. Thank you. Um, okay, first off. This verbal testimony is requested to lift up the names of the water warriors now in the heavenly realm, Auntie Bernice Kekahuna of Honopo, East Maui, and Auntie Diana Laigu of Waihe'e, as I carry on the Kuliana. Please be reinformed that HRS 7-1 reads in part, the people shall also have a right to drinking water and running water and the right of way, the springs of water, running water and road shall be free to all on all gra lands granted in fee. Civil Code 1859, Section 1477 of HRS 7-1, etc. The water being cut off by the corporate rancher upstream of Royal Patent 4948 is a clear violation of water rights afforded to Kanaka Maoli by virtue of CC 1859, Section 1477, affirmed by HRS 7-1. Over the past 11 months, no water has flowed in the natural OI system afforded to us for over 200 years. Our family has been entrusted to the ancestral kuleana of this place and served as the original conservation stewards till now. The, this act of intentionally depriving water is an encroachment upon Aboriginal rights of Kanaka Maoli, affirmed and guaranteed protection by the laws of Hawaii. Since October 23rd, 2020, with no water in the OI, I have continually asked how this continues to be allowed to happen. Specifically addressing Dean Ueno, to this date, no answer, verbal or written, has been provided referencing any rules and or laws to, to the contrary. In this matter, the Attorney General and the Department of Land and Natural Resources, formerly known as Ministry of Interior, is egregiously lawless. Therefore, at this juncture, I implore you to not be complicit, and I humbly request or asked that you have consideration and concern for rights established and declared by Mo'i Kamehameha III and affirmed as evidence in HRS 7-1, please allow me the courtesy of your intentions. For the sake of posterity, our cultural roots must be preserved and perpetuated. I want to be a part of a society in which my footprint mattered. Respectfully submitted, I remain Crystal May Nalani Smythe, daughter of Edmuna Smythe. Mahalo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next up is Emilio Alves. Emilu Alves. Mm, yeah, Emilu Alves, you are on mute. If you are ready to speak, please unmute yourself. You're, you're, you're on mute still. If you see the, the mute button on the bottom left of your screen, still muted. Maybe she can call in. Chair, there's information in the chat uh, regarding the possibility of a computer issue. I think I think she's trying to uh, call in. Take your time.
I don't want to share this is Hokuo Pellegrino. I have Emmy Lou on the phone. Is it okay if she speaks through my phone? That there's she's just having computer problems. Yep. Thank you for facilitating that. Go ahead. Um, Auntie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, you gotta speak really loud, okay? Because you're gonna be speaking through my computer. Okay, so um, my understanding is that your oral okay, testimony and the um, yep. bar commissioner people have already read that, correct? Yes, yes. So now is your oral testimony. So you are you're live, you're ready to go. You let me know and I will put my phone close to the a microphone. You ready? Okay. Okay, go ahead. The last 20 something years, um, first time in 27 years that I've uh, experienced any um, lack of water. We've always had water, and even in times of drought, we've had water. Uh, sometimes we had to go Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and, you know, 20 years ago when we were drought. But for the last 20 years, I've not experienced any time that no water. And I know we've had drought periods where the river has been low at times and high times. So my, I, I guess I'm, I have a question. So why, why are we being cut off with water now? And we haven't been cut off for the last 27 years. And my other question was, what, that cement uh, release gate, how would you release anything if it's um, cemented with hollow tile? But anyway, um, be clear, uh, we haven't had any water since October of last year, or very minimal water at, at some times. But, um, and, uh, we would really like to have water so that we can continue our um, farming. Since we do provide a lot of hollow and fruits and vegetables for the community, and uh, right now we are unable to do that. You Paul Ante? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna leave it on just in case anybody has questions for you. You can speak through my computer. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay, thank you. I think we were able to hear that. Appreciate that. Person. <laughs> Beats traveling. Um, okay, any questions, uh, commissioners? If not, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go on to our next testifier, who is Hokuao Pellegrino. Okay. Um, oh, I'm having computer issues. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I'll have my co chair case. Um, water commissioners and uh, community. My name is Okuao Pellegrino and I'm the president of Huyo Nova Eha. In 1850, there were document, there was 121 plus documented acres of Loikalo. Mr. Pellegrino, I just, if you, if you, there you go. Yep. Video. In 1850, there were 121 plus documented acres of wetland Kalo on the south side of Waikabu stream known uh, self-managed systems and sufficient water for Kuliana lands. Fast forward to 2021, there's less than eight acres of Kalo in active cultivation, actually none at the present moment due to no water. A corporation managing a derelict system dating 117 years old and landowners restricting access to clean, manage, or even look at what is happening to their water is occurring. Where is the justice in this? Juliana Kalo farmers have been long abused by plantation interests and water companies for now over 150 years. They continue to be held hostage and discriminated against by Wailuku Water Company, who picks and chooses who they want to provide water to. For example, paid customers versus legally protected rights of native Hawaiian Kuleana Kalo farmers. A decision and order has been handed down to the community based on our contested case set forth on June 28, 2021. Yet no one seems to be following it and definitely no one is enforcing it. Please read our complaint and more so the written testimony that we recently provided. The facts, the problems, and the solutions are clearly spelled out for you. Our Hui and community are not a bunch of complainers, but rather solution-minded, driven Kanaka to preserve a way of life, wanting to feed the community. We've laid out this fine, in a, with a fine tooth comb, exactly what needs to be done here and how this issue can be resolved. 
as you stated on page 360 of the DNO uh, F management of Kuliana Systems, paragraph 207, it states why the water company uh, and others are responsible to maintain their ditches to the point of delivery of water into the Kuliana ditch or pipe system with maintenance of the Kuliana ditches and pipes, the responsibility of the users. We're asking you to please take this seriously and resolve this swiftly, given that it has now been three months since the final decision and order and over 10 months since this problem has been ongoing. Um, I'd also like to just uh, you know, based on the presentation, share two things. The photo of reservoir number one, June 1st, 2020. Great picture, perfect example. When the water enters the reservoir number one, it goes to the south, which feeds Waikabu properties. The Kuliana pipe that, that feeds the Kulianas is on the north. And so whenever that water comes in, low or high, it always goes towards the south. So it's a great photo to show the injustice that's happening there for a paid customer versus water that isn't getting to um, the Kulianas. Secondly, is commissioners has mentioned about the cost of upgrading the Kuliana ditch. So back in 2016, I did a feasibility report for landowner likable properties who at that time was interested in looking at um, piping in that Kuliana system of one, one or 1.1 miles. At that time, it was roughly uh, about $150,000. Um, last week, I got uh, quotes from the only two piping companies that's on Maui for 12-inch pipe um, couplings and cleanouts. We're now looking at $865,000, which includes labor. Now, whether this should happen or not, should not be or ever fall on the Kulianas because what we recently found out that I think you folks are made aware of is that that Kuliana ditch, while owned by Waikabu Properties, there's a perpetual easement or easement that my local water company has on that. And so they have restricted access for cleaning, management, or even just looking at the problem. Our, these Kuliana landowners have been, um, ha have literally been threatened and you know, asked not to even go up to the reservoir to see what is occurring. They're not allowed to clean the ditch that their water comes from. Um, and, and so you know, I, I just want you to remember if, if you had a chance to look at our, um, our complaint as well as the, um, the testimony that we've provided. Remember, in 2007, Wailuku Water Company now, they provided data showing that they were giving upwards of 10 plus kulianas, 840,000 gallons of water. Here we are, where we're talking about less than seven um, with a, a third, not even a fraction of that amount, and yet these kulianas are not receiving the water. Um, so there, there's, there's some big issues here. And the fact that um, there is a non-permitted user that is using that water, and I can confirm uh, and I, I am happy to provide the evidence if need be. Kumu Farms has not, and I repeat, has not been farming on any of the Waikabu fields supplied by Reservoir One for over two years now. I have drone footage of that. I have confirmation from the landowner of Waikabu Properties that Kumu Farms has not been farming there. Um, what has happened is that the old plantation pipe that goes beyond the um, cattle troughs, um, we recently learned that this water from Waikabu from reservoir number one can drop into Waihe'e ditch as well as um, other reservoirs below that feed. And Kumu Farms is on Waihe'e uh, Waihe ditch. They're in Waigapu, but they, their irrigated water comes from Waihe'e. It's been going on for, for like I said, a couple of years now. Um, Kumu Farms is being used as the pawn in this situation, not by the landowner, but being held hostage by Wailuku Water Company, who's uh, illegally giving putting white reservoir number one water into other sources when that's not supposed to be happening. The only users of reservoir number one and self Waikabu ditch, uh, off-stream users should be Waikabu properties or the cattle, which is why we're making it very clear that the, the best resolution here is to allow the water for the Kulianas to be dropped into that Kuliana ditch before the reservoir. I mean, why would you want to fill up a 10, you know, sorry, a 7 million gallon reservoir for 1,800 uh, gallons uh, for off-stream use? It makes no sense at all. Um, it's very, this, the solution is very clear. It's very easy. I spelled it out in our testimony. Um, if you can just look at that page, just with the solutions, I, I, think, I, I think this would work with the help of the commission and commission staff to enforce this. Mahalo. Thank you. Questions, commissioners? Go on to our next Chair, 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 just a comment. I just, just want to thank the Hui for presenting really coherent testimony that's that's lays out facts and as well as uh, 
uh, that identifies the issue and, and has a solution to it. So I appreciate that. And we'll decide how the people feel about those, the, the, uh, the recommended solutions, but uh, we really appreciate the clarity of the testimony. Thank you. Um, next up is Pam Bunn. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners, staff, and community. I really have nothing to add to the testimony of the HUI. I think they've done a marvelously eloquent job in laying out the problem and the solutions and just urge you to, to take great care in implementing one of those solutions. So thank you. And if I have extra time and any of the HUI members need more time to testify, I would be happy to have them speak. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more person signed up, um, but I don't see that person, Ho'okahi Alves. Oh, sorry. Mistake, I'm sorry, Isaac Morawaki. I missed you. Uh, Isaac Morawaki. Sure. Um, good morning, Chair Case, Commission members, Isaac Morawaki, Earth Justice on behalf of Hoyo Nabaiha. Um, I appreciate the commission staff for this presentation, bringing this matter to the commission. It's long overdue and, and very urgent. Uh, it was urgent 10 months ago um, and all the more so now. And I appreciate the commission also for the forward progress on these issues. For example, in its final DNO, the recognition of Kuleana Native Hawaiian rights as the top priority uh, in that decision order. And now we actually need to start acting on it like we mean it. Um, and most of all, I appreciate Kuliana Navaiha and the Kuliana right holders for their patience and, and grace under these really unconscionable circumstances. So I agree. Mr. Pellegrino has really summed up the situation better than a lawyer could really. And I, and I told him I gave him an honorary legal degree for uh, his testimony submitted today and just how he laid it, laid it out. And like he said, solution-minded and forward-looking. Uh, I just want to emphasize though, uh, the fundamentals here and, and how unprecedented this is. Occasionally, over the 17 years I've been working on this case, we'd get complaints from Kulianas about sudden shutoffs. Usually it's a maintenance issue. Sometimes they get noticed, sometimes they don't. Usually it, were, it, it lasts for days, maybe a week or two. But never in my 17 years working on this case have I ever seen such an outright dictatorial cutoff of Kuleana rights for almost a year running now. This is nothing short of a travesty of justice and a breakdown of the social order. And we're talking about going back 100, 150 years at this point. This is established history. The very first water cases in this region, Kuleanas take first before the plantations. The agreements between Waluku Sugar and HCNS in which they acknowledge we supply the Kulianas first before we take our water. Even Wailuku Water Companies, when it turned into a water company, its own documents, its prospective on its business, its prospectus, I'm sorry, they had a white paper. And even their agreements with their, their, their customers recognizes the obligations to priority Kuleana rights in times of drought. So, so many of you may recall at the end of 2017 uh, regarding the really egregious violations of the White Kapu in-stream flow standard at that time. Uh, the former commissioner Balfour said that it seemed like Waluku Water Company was getting away with murder. And that was his words. So, so what do we call this? Kuleana rights have been around for more than a century longer than the in-stream flow standards. Uh, and so that's why we're emphasizing that the Commission needs to be the Konohiki ultimately in these types of situations. And the DNO, we got a lot of advice. I think that's what Mr. Ueno called it on how Kuleanas are responsible for their own Awai. Uh, but now Wailuku Water Company is prohibiting the Kuleana users from even maintaining or reopening their own Awai flow. The word for that is catch 22. It's just ridiculous. So the question is not only how can this happen, but how has it been allowed to go on for so long. The Hui reached out to the commission for months. The Kulianas also reached out directly. We were told that this would be addressed in the decision in order. That decision came out in June, almost three months ago. So I'll just close with the legal mandate here. I mentioned the history and it's undisputed. It's established for 100, 150 years. <clears throat> but even in modern Hawaii law, article 
11, Section 7, establishes this commission, expressly includes in its constitutional kuleana, assuring appurtenant rights. It's there in black and white in our state constitution. And this is why we have the commission. This is exactly what the commission needs to do here. And that's what these kuleana right holders are asking you commissioners to do to assure their pertinent rights. I'm available for any questions on the legalities of this or the legal issues. I understand there's some doubt being uh, kicked up here, uh, some, 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 uh, um, some smoke screens on, on some legal issues. I'm happy to address those directly. And as far as the, the factual the details here, uh, I, I, again, I, I don't think anyone could have done a better job than Mr. Pellegrino on behalf of the Hui. So thank you very much for this, uh, for your attention on this very important matter and look forward to, for you taking action. Thank you. I think that's it for public testimony. Is there anyone else I missed? All right, then uh, uh, questions, comments, commissioners. Mr. Buck. Yeah, uh, I'd be curious to ask from staff what recommendation they have. I mean, obviously one, yeah, I mean, uh, what recommendations you have so we, we could uh, comply with, with our recent d d d decision in order? I think, I mean, one recommendation, one possibility, I mean, maybe to, you know, as, as Mr. Pellegrino noted, um, directly feed the, the Kuliana Awai as well as um, the cattle operation directly from the intake and remove the reservoir from operation. Um, you know, that would be a higher, a bigger hurdle to overcome, but uh, that would eliminate loss, uh, so address some of the loss issues. Um, D -D -D, let me just follow up. What I heard from Mr. Pellegrino is only allow the amount for uh, for the cattle operations to go to the reservoir, but make sure the OI gets their full distribution before water entering the reservoir. You say that might be a hard so that um, might be hard to implement. Just uh, eliminating the the use of the reservoir. I mean that that need to come an order from the commission, um, being that it's it's private property. Uh, that's certainly an option. Um, but you know, and then there are issues with. Um, storage, right, and building up storage capacity. Uh, what are, are there options for that? Um, you know, in times of drought. Um, so that's another consideration. Um, just that a, a lot of the, the issue needs to be um, kind of discussed a little in more detail. I think. And just to note, um, Mr. Pellegrino did note in that. Just wants to make clear that they aren't asking to discontinue use of the reservoir, um, but just ensuring that the Kuliana gets water first. Um, so, you know, that may include use, using the, instead of using the pipe from the reservoir, um, prioritizing the use through the, the control gate um, to the Awai first. Yeah. And then our, our decision and order also said that uh, either staff or representatives of the staff will have access to uh, 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 these d d diversion points. Do you believe that that's also not being followed? Uh, diversion points meaning the dis distribution or? Well, we, we wanted to make sure that for transparency that people are staff, even if it was on private lands or our authorized representatives would have access to these diversion points so we could have full transparency and the amount of water do you believe that 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 condition is being is being followed? That's not what I heard from some of the tests. Um, no, for us um, as staff, we are able to get to the reservoir. Um, we we do need to access um, that area to get to our gauge, which is um, upstream of the reservoir, um, upstream and down towards the river, um, to get to our gauge. Um, but I think the issue is the Kuleana users aren't able to access the. Um, the reservoir or the, you know, the, uh, where the water is released into the uh, water. Uh, again, the, our decision said our staff or authorized representatives, which would be representatives uh, of our staff. So that is, that is an option for staff to consider. 
Ms. Kagawa Viviani and then Mr. Hannes. Actually, I'll let Commissioner Hannes uh, ask first. Thank you, Aurora. Uh, I, do we note or should we conclude by the uh, fact that uh, Wailuku Water is absent here, that they are in agreement or they would be accepting of all the solutions that have been put forth by the Hui? I, I will jump in, Dean. This is Kaleo Man Deputy. Um, I will say I, I, I wouldn't make that conclusion. Um, we have reached out to Wailuku Water Company and been communicating with them. Um, and I've personally been trying to help facilitate the conversations between parties here uh, in a staff level um, informal process. Um, and I think we're at the point that we need to, any final decision and recommendation needs to happen formally with this commission. Um, so I, I don't, I would not assume anything about their presence. I will say that we have shared all the same information with all parties. So uh, Mr. Suzuki, Waikapu Properties, um, Wailuku Water Company, as well as the Hui and all of the Kuleana tenants um, and farmers have gotten all the same emails from, from myself and staff. So they are aware of this conversation and, and maybe watching on YouTube, um, but they are not present in the, the meeting right now. But no assumption, I, I would not make an assumption of agreement based on the solutions recommended by the Hui. And did they supply any written testimony that I may have missed? We did not receive any written testimony from Wailuku Water Company. Thank you. And, and would you characterize uh, or would agree with it, and maybe we're back to Dean, would agree with the characterization of, of uh, Mr. Pellegrino as to how Reservoir One works in terms of water naturally kind of moving south, uh, which is the side that is su supports Mr. Suzuki and not the side uh, that supports uh, the uh, protected uses. Um, just to clarify, I believe it's uh, Waikapu Properties that the Wai intake, was, yeah. pardon me. Um, but let me uh, defer to um, Dr. Aaron Strzok. Um, he's more familiar with the reservoir. And you're, you're correct in that there is flow to the south, the, the initial reservoir was expanded. And so you can actually see the difference in elevation of the two bottoms um, in, in, Dean's, in the photos provided. Um, the, uh, you know, we don't know the loss in whether one side loses more than the other. Um, one proposed solution that was discussed was um, having the reservoir, you know, putting building a, a um, co better compartmentalization, you know, right through the middle so that you fill up one side and you get better head in the pipes um, at lower volumes, um, both to the AWI and to the other users. Um, and that, that might help with the, the solution without removing the reservoir's functionality. Is it reasonable to expect uh, those users uh, of water from the reservoir to invest in some kind of pipe system so that they get their water much more efficiently? Because right now, there's two problems created by the use of the reservoir. Number one, it's unlined and there's a there's loss of valuable resource. And number two, it's configured, it's the, the, the design of the reservoir is such that it impairs our ability to meet the needs of the uh, uh, the protected Kuleana users, so we need an. It's not a good solution for us. Is which, it yeah, Commissioner Hannes, I think which is uh, why uh, the Hui's recommendation is made the way it's made, um, based on on the record and what and how the system operates and functions. That there is a more efficient way that they're proposing to get water directly to the priority users that you folks have identified in your DNO before um, other users on that system. Yeah, so the, the other parts of the system could be inefficient or provided in other ways, but the priority users that, that you folks have prioritized in the decision and order, um, the solutions recommended by the Hui 
emphasize that that priority. Uh, Claire, let me ask the question this way. Uh, th thank you for that. That's on point. Uh, but let me also ask: Is there anything in the solution, the four solutions uh, advanced by the Hui, that is not in keeping with our DNO? The, does the Hui so do the the solutions of the Hui strengthen or or align with our DNO, or or strengthen our ability to enforce? Uh, short answer, I think it is in alignment with the commission's decision in order okay. um, with reducing waste in system efficiencies, a sense of prioritization um, based on the recommendations, they are consistent with the, the policies and the decisions the commission has made in the decision in order. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Katiam. Thank you, Chair. Kaleo, as you're talking to the, the various parties in crafting, I hope, a, a long-term solution, is there a way to capture high flows of water, holding it and distributing low during periods of low time? I guess, what is the capacity of that reservoir one? And I agree with Aaron is that, you know, if we can't replace the reservoir to its original capacity, Com making it smaller is always better. Because you get a lot more head and get a lot more efficient use of the water. And I don't know what the pan is of that reservoir in the surface area, but I'm sure reducing the size helps reduce the uh, transformational losses as well. So Kaleo, from a timeline perspective as you're you know addressing the various parties what do you think uh, how much time do you need to get a solution or some uh, obvious choices on how we can resolve these issues and I, I like the Hui's uh, presentation of facts problems and solutions I, I thought it was outstanding thank you Mahalo, Commissioner Katayama. Um, I'll try to answer this as succinctly, succinctly as possible. Um, I think uh, based on the complaints and the situation and the facts um, and even staff's um, you know, investigation into the matters, um, we do want and plan to bring something for formal action to the commission next month to expedite um, movement and some decisions um, and get some immediate kind of reprieve and, and um, water to, and ensure that water is making it to Kulana users. Um, in addition, there are some longer term um, strategies or implementation, I think that as a commission, we have to continue to monitor and manage. Um, one of those is put, how is this reservoir used, um, whether it continues to be used and is a useful a water storage facility, and that's coordination and communication with the owner um, and manager of the system. And so I think that's a longer conversation that we need to have, and we could build in long term, longer term recommendations on, you know, feasibility. I think the design capacity of the reservoir, as mentioned, is about seven MGD. Um, uh, in the broadbed report, it's 12 million gallons. Well, I think it, the current capacity might be 7 MGD because of siltation. I think that's one of the issues. It's still kind of unknown um, when we had talked to Wailuku Water Company. So, you know, clean, cleaning it, dredging it out, and, you know, re building it back up to that design capacity could be a solution. But again, those are some of the longer term uh, conversations we can have and should have um, as, in implementing the commission's decision in order. So time frame wise. You know, we're bringing this, um, we plan to bring something with a recommendation for the commission based on the conversations today, based on feedback from you folks, based on community input, um, and then also highlight some of the longer term strategies for implementation um, to meet the intent of the commission's decision and order. Um, it is complex as we're learning um, who manages, who's the landowner. Um, some of that is, is not consistent with some of the DNO. For example, we had said, you know, Awai users should manage that Awai. 
Um, but if they're not permitted access, then that becomes problematic, right? Um, so those are things that we're working through and, and hopefully can come up with some resolutions to um, both look, immediately and long term. Good. Look forward to the October meeting and its progress. Thanks, Khalil. Thank you. Mr. Buck. Yeah, uh, thank you, Claire. And I'm glad that we will have some opportunity to make a decision on this issue. Uh, my, I guess, provisional recommendation is that I also believe that the, the, the WHOI's recommendations are consistent with, with our decision and order. And, and uh, some communication with the affected par, par, par parties that do, does all, uh, provide them a copy of the WHOI's recommendations and that um, I don't know how we, we, we think uh, it is consistent with our decision and order and give them a short time frame to provide us some written testimony before next next meeting when we actually will on this issue. Uh, I, I think that's probably the most expedition way to move forward at this time. So I, um, there, there's some stuff going on in the chat that um, needs, needs to be in sunshine. Um, so, if you have something to say, I, I would request that you um, offer it. Um, Mr. Pellegrino, I think you have a document called the History of Reservoir One. I think probably the right thing to do would be to provide this to staff um, and that, you know, as appropriate, the staff can include it in uh, the, the, the upcoming agenda item. Um, and uh, yeah. Chair Case, maybe one more of just my own personal opinion. The we think the I think the reservoirs are very important in the long term solution. And how do we kind of convert those to liabilities uh, uh, to assets? So uh, I'm hoping we come up with, with uh, a final solution that does preserve short term the reservoirs, so they can be part of a much longer term efficiencies for the water delivery system. Great, thanks. Any other comments on this, Dawa Viviani? I just wanted to uh, uh, yeah, thank the, the testifiers and, and the staff for this information. You know, I'm uh, trying to catch up on um, a lot of this. One thing that occurs to me, listening to um, everything that's presented, is we have multiple convening issues um, are laid out. Uh, you know, the context of drought, but I think even just looking, for me, looking at the data and, and the, the, the flow time series, there's also the imprints of a lot of, you know, human activity and diversion where something that looks like very steady groundwater fed flow becomes much more ephemeral <clears throat> post May 2020. And so understanding like, how, well, one question I have is how well do we really understand this system? Um, not just this OI setting, um, but the interconnectedness of both the hydrology and the water use, because all of that's playing in and the person at the end of the line is always the one that you know, gets short shrift. Um, and, and also we're talking a lot about engineering solutions and yeah, I'm trained as an engineer, but I think a lot of what I'm hearing is really uh, relates to power differentials that are inherent in who's, who's upstream and who's downstream and who gets access first and not. And so um, I don't, um, I guess I'm wondering how you know, we as a commission can think more systemic, like systematically, holistically about, um, you know, as we think about enforcement, um, what our role is in mediating some of those power imbalances, especially you know, someone like me, I've never walked that system. But but being able to, you know, it's it, yeah, it's impossible. We can't have Kuliana users maintain in the Port Lima system if if we have different land tenure systems, which we do have now, um, and we have access issues. Um, it really. Uh, rings like hypocritical of the mission if, to, to give advice that really, but, but not empower um, 
folks on this system. So I guess I just, um, I, I'd like to hear from the other commissioners on how, um, how we, what our role is in mediating some of these sort of power issues or maybe it's up to staff, but I do feel that we as commissioners have a role um, because I think everybody does want the water to be stewarded and distributed well, but it's, it's not just through the depth of the reservoir or the, um, through energy deeds. Um, that, that's what I'm hearing right now. But monitoring is part of that. Transparency is part of that. Um, you know, hopefully in the future as we get up to speed dealing with these conflicts promptly, 10 months, it, especially going through this past summer is, I, I just wonder how people even made it this past year. I, I hadn't noticed that the water's been shut up. And I'm still kind of shocked by that. So um, mahalo everybody for presenting, but yeah, I'd like to hear from the commissioner. So. Um, how we go past just engineering piecemeal solutions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pellegrino, one, one other thought I had is, you know, uh, next time this comes up on the agenda, you can attach what you think is relevant information to your testimony or, or link it um, so that when we post the testimony, um, it's, it's got full availability to everyone. Um, and let's see, Ms. Kagaviviani, I mean, this is something that, um, you know, is, is definitely wrestled with in the decision. Um, when, one, one complication is that we are not, we're not part of the agreement uh, between the users and the uh, Wailuku Water Company as distributors, but Wailuku Water Company is required to provide water to the diversion points um, in, in the in the agreement, and if uh, this system has a, a flaw that it doesn't allow the uh, uh, provision of water to the LY um, because it's going through the, the the reservoir, that's that's a problem that I think is is right for us to address. Um, you know, we can we can we can easily be overwhelmed in uh, policing this system. And so we have to be careful about what is our role and what is really the responsibility of all, all of the users and diverters. Um, so that's that's pretty carefully thought through in the DNO, um, but it's, it's a complicated system and set of people and it's a lot of people. And um, so we have to try to work through that. Obviously, this is all very complicated, very much complicated by the drought situation. And I'm just going to say, you know, as the climate changes and the earth warms and the distribution of water gets more uh, random uh, through drought and flood cycles, um, this, is, this is just a little microcosm of what's happening all over the planet in terms of the impact on um, uh, on, on the relationships between uh, users and distributors of, of water. So that's, that's part of an overarching comp complication that, you know, we just have to do our best to, to moderate um, as, as, as we are um, required to do and able to do. Um, but I, I, I will say, I appreciate the staff bringing this as a, as a information item it has been really helpful to bring the information items uh, prior to bringing in action items, so we get a chance to, you know, really fully vet it and, and think it through. Um, it's, you know, the the absence of whether the water company in these discussions is uh, note, noted, notable, and uh, problematic. Um, I, I think they're. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna speculate on what they're, um, wh why they're not here, or what their positions are. I'm sure they have some some positions that, um, you know, they'll have to express if uh, if they want them considered in a, in a decision. Any other questions, comments? Okay. With that, uh, that brings us to the end of uh, B1. Chair, I, was I was trying to, I was having difficulty unmuting, but I just want to speak to Aurora's 
uh, requests for other uh, input on this is that no, number one, we, we we needed to set policy and mm -hmm. the DNO did that. Number two, we need to be serious about uh, making sure that policy gets enforced and implemented. And that's where staff comes in, but also community. And so uh, supporting staff and expecting it of staff, but also supporting staff in their efforts to to make sure that there's a naturalization of, of the uh, uh, the DNO is uh, is important. And so we I think we're doing that. The, the third thing is it ultimately, you know, when it's a, you know, you're pl trying to play uh, cops against people who are trying to, you know, uh, create problems or are misaligned with our decisions. Uh, it, it's always a, you know, it's it's a, it's not an efficient way to go about business. We need a better community, and I really appreciate what uh, Kaleo is doing in terms of meeting with people offline to bring the parties together to kind of get through the historic, you know, uh, kind of polarities and issues that divided us to really try and, and, and bring them around to uh, the uh, kind of the new order and the new war world that we're trying to impose here. Um, not going to happen overnight. I think we, we know that. And I think we just have to be consistent and relentless in our effort to kind of build that community that understands what we expect and how water is to be treated. Uh, and and uh, the and, and make the investments, make the uh, exercise the personal goodwill that's necessary to to act like a responsible community, and that's why I'm so you know uh, impressed by the Hui's testimony, which did, did just that. It it was certainly there's passion there, but there's also kind of a factual base, you know, identification of problems and and set forth setting forth a solution. So we need more of that. Thank you. May I comment on implementation? Please. Okay. Um, we've been working uh, with Wailuku Water to report their, both the amount of water diverted from the stream as required by the decision and order and the amount of water distributed to the OY. And we, um, we just don't have the capability of doing that ourselves. And, and that's why I believe the commission um, in the DNO um, stated that the, the, the users have to report this. And we're trying to get um, that information out to the public as soon as possible, as soon as we get these, um, the infrastructure necessary uh, installed. Um, we're, you know, it's our responsibility to make sure the IFS is maintained, uh, but we, we just can't run around measuring everybody's use. Mr. Buck, did you want to add something? No, sorry, I thought I saw your hand up. All right, anybody else? Okay, thank you all very much. That brings us to the end of B1. Appreciate everybody's thoughts. Let's take a five minute break.
Okay, we're gonna come back to the Commission on Water Resource Management meeting. Just wanna make sure everyone's here. All right. Okay, let's go ahead, B2. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Aaron Strauch with the Stream Protection and Management Branch. Item B2 is the status of the order to Honolulu Board of Water Supply to bulkhead the Haiku Tunnel in Heia. Um, this decision was made in the, I believe it was May uh, 2021 commission meeting and um, as part of the implementation commission requested that um, we work with the community and board of water supply um, by uh, gathering together quarterly to talk about the status and um, talk about implementation the usgs mm -hmm. study and um, uh, part of the order was to reduce the groundwater withdrawal from the uh, approximately 1 million gallons per day uh, to 0.3 million gallons per day. Um, we met last week and the Board of Water Supply um, responded that they would uh, ramp down their withdrawal to the 0.3 million gallons per day in August. And they are working on um, monitoring the daily flows, um, both from the tunnel and the Haiku well um, in Heia. Um, and so they've, they've met the, um, the, the, what has been established by the commission so far. Any questions? All right, uh, questions, commissioners? We can go to public testimony if we're, um, if there are no questions. And so first up would be Ernie Lau, uh, Board of Water, Honolulu Board of Water Supply. Uh, good morning, Chair and members. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Aloha, everybody. It's a nice uh, wet day I'm, uh, on Oahu in Manoa. It's raining and good recharge for our aquifers. I'm very happy. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to provide an update to the commission. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, turn this over to Barry Usagawa, head of our Water Resources Division, to provide the update uh, report and uh, be available for any questions from the commissioners later. Uh, thank you, Barry, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ernie. Uh, uh, good morning, Madam Chair and commissioners. If I could share my screen, uh, I could um, walk you through our written uh, letter here. Um, to me. So yeah, good morning. So as Aaron was saying, we were able to reduce the Haiku Tunnel uh, production to 0.3 on, on August 7th. Um, and um, our water production um, reporting is a, a one of the other requirements for monthly reports of daily production. I believe it said, and we we are still working towards installing a new water meter, uh, and it would likely be put in uh, before the end of the year. Um, until that, until then, we don't have daily production data. It's it's only physical spot reads. So we we have a a, a meter that that records both the well and the tunnel at the same time, and it doesn't differentiate. So we need to put in, you know, it's, it's already planned as part of the uh, renovation of Haiku Well is to put in this new meter. But um, we, in order for us to do that, we have to cut into the pipe. So we have to shut down both the tunnel and the well for 30 days. Uh, and the 30 days is because we need the concrete to, to strengthen before we turn the, put the water back in. Uh, to open the valves. Um, 
but we require Eula Caldwell to be back in service first, otherwise we don't have any water for the valley. Um, so it will, the shutdown will occur in the next several months um, when water demand is lower, but we should be um, completed before the end of the year. And then from then on, we will provide uh, that daily uh, production of both the tunnel and the well. Um, we provided some monitoring of uh, our monitoring of the Haiku tunnel and uh, your stream flow. This is the graph that uh, you may have as a hard copy there. Um, it displays, um, it's just an extension of the graph that we submitted previously. Uh, the stream flow is in blue here. Uh, this is the USGS ESG engage. Uh, the uh, rainfall, we have a rain gauge um, by um, in, in the valley. That's the gray here. Haiku tunnel um, production is this line, kind of a brown, and then the yellow is the well. So as of August 7th, we reduced the tunnel down, uh, but the demand is still there. So the well is, you know, uh, so it has, has to uh, compensate. Um, that's what we have. Um, we we um, also, uh, we note that the rainfall in the in the valley has been below normal for all but one month into 2021. So this likely contributes to the lack of stream flow increase in Hia stream, even when Haiku tunnel flow was reduced. But you know, we need more data. It will, it, it's going to take time and, and rainfall for the water to build um, back up behind the bulkhead. Uh, this is the rainfall total graph here. Sorry. Um, so in the brown is the 30-year average for the rain gauge in Haiku. And in the 2021, as is blue from January to August, you can see that it's about half of what uh, uh, the average is. So it's below rain, below normal rainfall, and that's contributing to the low flows in, in the stream. Um, we also are working towards installing a new pressure gauge at the portal. Uh, so our, our crews are scheduled to install it in, in October. Um, we have two pressure gauges currently, but they're both reading different pressures. So it's a, it's a head scratcher. Um, but based on the portal elevation of 550 feet, we believe there is a, approximately 87 feet of head being built up behind the last bulkhead. Uh, the new pressure gauge readings will confirm this existing data and serve as a key indicator of our dike water recovery. Now, just an example, the other gauge is reading 27 feet. So it's quite a bit different. There are two pipes coming out of the, the portal and we have to dig it up and, and see which pipe the, the thing's on, but we'll, we'll, we'll install a new one and, and, and that would provide us the, uh, uh, the, the, the indicator of dike recovery going forward. Um, but we expect with higher head levels behind the bulkhead that the discharges will increase into the gaining segments of both Haiku and Ilika stream. Uh, the USGS um, uh, reported at their meeting last week uh, that the commission staff um, um, coordinated uh, with the, um, you know, the the restoration groups in here. Uh, they reported that they have um, um, starting to initiate their field reconnaissance, including the stream seepage runs. So I brought this map from them. Our Haiku tunnel is here. The Haiku well is here in blue. The stream's in blue. Um, Iolika is, is here in blue. These red dots are where they uh, did their seepage runs. This is the active gauge. Uh, this is the confluence of Iolika and the ES stream. Um, and so they they are still you know data is still preliminary but they've they've done um, uh, started work and our staff is helping them. Um, they're installing uh, temporary stream gauges as well on, on both tributaries here. Um, so we look forward to their results. But um, just wanted to report that they've uh, that that is moving forward. Um, the assessment of the bulkhead feasibility and preliminary engineering report and I'll walk you through the scope. Uh, the, the draft scope. Um, we're in the process of procuring a consultant. We should have 
them on board before the end of the year. By the end of the year, our budget is five hundred thousand dollars, and it's a two-year study. Uh, and um, so let me let me let me go to that please um, first, and uh, since I'm talking about it. So this is the bulkhead preliminary engineering study. The, um, I hope you can see this. Um, so the results of the study were provided by BWS with guidance for responding to the to sea worms order. Um, so there are four scope items that are concurrent actions. The first one is uh, gathering historic information to re be reviewed for the study, um, available Board of Water Supply draft designs and reports, our production and monitoring data, uh, in coordination with the, the uh, USGS um, HIA watershed study as well. Um, and while they're doing that, we're proposing to conduct a multi-season tunnel pressure dike storage and stream gauge testing program. And this would include closing the Haiku Tunnel Discharge Pipeline for up to two years, rainfall dependent, hopefully not that long, but um, we, with weekly measurements from the new pressure gauge that we're installing uh, to measure head level gains and trends behind the last bulkhead. Um, and um, also evaluate the impacts to our water, our, our, our water system from closing the line. Um, well, I do want to mention that that the reason why we're doing this is that in 1969 we have some data that shows that this was done uh, with the tunnel, uh, but we uh, some of the data that we have are inconsistent, so we wanted to see, but the, you know, to, to to verify if we can repeat it. The um, the idea here is to kind of maximize the storage potential behind the, the dike and then and then bleed off the point three from there. Um, so try to keep a high head level behind the dike. Um, and we, if we can do that, then we balance um, uh, beneficial use with um, you know fostering seepage back into the stream and back in the stream restoration. So um, that's the idea, rather than keeping it low, let's see how high we can get it. And there's there's inf yeah, information that it can get pretty high, although it's um, volume wise, it's not a big dike, but it can, it, the pressure can build up pretty high. So anyway, that, that's why we're proposing that. Um, and then the evaluation, so, this consultant would be civil geotechnical hydrogeologic. Um, and so to determine the maximum water level that can be sustained behind the bulkhead uh, for perhaps a range of tunnel withdrawal rates around a central tendency of 0.3, we want to keep it at, you know, in, in line with the order. Um, the constructability of installing another bulkhead at the last dike um, will require uh, confined space um, uh, requirements, and you know we don't know if we have to dismantle. The, well, we have to dismantle the existing hatch doors and the pipes in a tunnel. Um, there are three foot doors in each of the dikes, and um, you know we don't know if we can actually get the equipment through there. But you need air duct lines to, as well. Uh, trying to do that without the demolition of the dikes, but they do, they would evaluate that. So with or without demolition, rebuilding the dike, the, the existing bulkheads, because there's a risk in, in breaking the bulkheads down. And if we can't rebuild them with enough seal, you know, it doesn't do a, uh, it could be detrimental. Um, so, but if the water gains in the shut-in testing don't reach anticipated levels, whatever we define that to be, then, uh, then the, then the next step is the additional bulkhead insulation. Um, one thing that we're real concerned about is microbiological biological contamination. From, uh, the risk of constructing in the tunnel and even from entering the tunnel, um, based on our experience with other tunnels, um, the micro, micro contamination has forced us to close 
a number of our sources. Um, so we need to understand how that will affect it and what are the mitigated measures to minimize the impacts. So, you know, it's not an irrigation source, it's a drinking water source. So, so, so um, contamination is, is a, you know, a, a real factor for us. Um, and then how to recertify the, the, the tunnel once, you know, the work is done um, so that it can then become a drinking water source again. Um, um, then assess the costs and benefits of the impacts, so balancing the production um, while meeting uh, the Haiku Valley water demand, um, and come up with up to three alternatives uh, with and without bulkheading, uh, including conceptual layouts um, of each alternative. And then the planning level, planning budgeting level, design and construction cost estimates and schedules, uh, and the permitting. Uh, required for to do that kind of work, provide an optimum recommendation. And um, while the, the other concurrent is to do conduct and document agency regional stakeholder coordination meet, uh, and meetings, then the final drafts, uh, contract term again is two years and the budget is half a million dollars. So um, that's the scope if, uh, and then the last, I'd like to just, uh, the last point on our letter was that we've, sent letters to the large water users in the, you know, to limit water use for large users ex expansion plans. So attached with our letter are three letters, one to the State Department of Health, Adventist Health Castle and Hawaii Memorial Park Cemetery, uh, notifying them of the order. And uh, in light of the limitation of water supply that we're requiring necessary actions to limit increases in Water pursuant to the order um, and to our rules and regulations on availability of water and non potable use. So, um, so for instance, when a cemetery does come in for their expansion, you know, we're going to require uh, advanced conservation measures and uh, perhaps zero scaping around the expanded area, but also look into tying into the veteran, state veteran cemetery is not potable water system that was built in the Hadiko interchange and see if they can use that. Uh, so, so those are some of the, um, those are the actions that we've um, been able to progress through. And um, with that, I'm open to any questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Barry. Very are there any questions? Um, let's see, can, can we uh, stop share screen so we can all... Um... Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Okay, questions. Mr. Katayama. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I think in the original conversation, you had talked about the state hospital water system and how they had a well. Is that... Uh, in it plays any part of your look at uh, different alternatives as part of your study? It, it should. Um, I, I thought the commission staff were going to update um, you on the well. Um, I hadn't included it in the letter. Um, I, I will next time. Um, but yeah, the, the well is uh, was drilled in, I believe, 2000, early 2000s and right above the hospital. So um, I apologize. I haven't, you know, gotten any update on, on that possibility, but that, that, that would be key to helping us, you know, reduce the tunnel production. The less we use from the tunnel, the more that's going to stay in the stream, right? Um, I don't know if staff has anything on update on the well. Yeah, um, Ryan Imada, he is here with our groundwater branch, and I think he had reached out to DOH. Um, so Ryan, do you have any update on that follow-up item? Um, yes, um, actually, and maybe Joanna can uh, speak to this a little bit too. But I, um, you know, I had a conversation with her about um, 
about the state hospital system. Um, did a little bit of research on it. Um, I, I do think that there is a component that's going to be difficult for the state hospital to be certified as um, as a public water system. And I think that there's a time, um, you know, time constraint on that. I think it's going to take a couple of years, possibly, uh, for them to be able to, uh, if that were something that they were exploring, for them to get off of the board system. And I don't know if Joanna wants to uh, uh, expand on that. Sure, thanks, Ryan. Um, so I, in my other job, I am the Safe Drinking Water Branch Acting Chief. Um, and they, I've reached out to the staff there. They've informed me that there is a capacity process that new public water systems, <clears throat> excuse me, need to complete prior to becoming a regulated public water system. Um, it involves uh, production of construction plans, new source engineering report, capacity documents at the pre-construction and startup capacity stages. So we are looking at um, possibly a 2022, 2023 timeline for the drinking water to come from that well. And we also don't know if DLNR will be providing um, property rights to that well. Um, th so there's a lot of questions that are still unanswered at this point. Um, and we would encourage the Board of Water Supply again to please look at other reuse options um, for the other large uh, water users that could use uh, reuse instead of the drinking water from the wells and the tunnel. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Khalil, deputy again. Uh, and so I think, um, thanks Joanna um, for that and Ryan, um, you know, we wanted to bring this back to commission and provide an update and um, that this is going to be a continuous conversation and process uh, to look through to meet the intent of the commission's order, right? Which is really to, in order to help really restore stream flows or protect the in-stream values, um, we need to also look at um, how wells um, can be and pumpage can be distributed in order to meet that need. So, committed to that. Mr. Buck. Yes, quick. Any update on conversations with the uh, Kaneohe, uh, uh, the Marine Mill Military Base, which I believe is the largest user. Uh, yeah, our plan is actually to send a letter to them. Barry, have we sent a letter to the uh, Marine Corps uh, yet? Oh, no, not, yet. Not, yet. not yet. Not yet. We're... Yeah, they, they, we've been corresponding through email. But the last update was, you know, unchanged. They they still um, working towards um, bringing their reuse system back online um, once they install the landscaping buffer between the golf course and their expanded residential um, units. So um, we did have a mini break in, in Hawaii Kai, which uh, uh, the dropped water levels um, on a windward system as well. Um, they bottomed out in, in, in Hawaii Kai. Uh, folks went out without water for like 36 hours, which is, um, Unusual for us, but we tried to bring winter water around, but we, we couldn't. And and uh, only limited amounts. Our reservoirs in Kailua and you know, dropped, and subsequently the reservoirs on the marine base dropped as well. And so there's there's a there's been a, um, some correspondence between our operations and the uh, the marine base on how to restore their water levels. Um, our system is back to normal, but um, you know, I don't know. They're, they're, they're still looking at it, but but it, it just goes to the point that um, you know water is limited on the winter side. So when you get these types of emergencies when transmission main breaks, um, and water reservoir levels um, are dropping um, because of it, that we don't have apparently enough source to refill them. So. 
Uh, it's just an ongoing challenge. Uh, you know, we'll get through it. Uh, yeah, and uh, Commissioner Buck, you know, our, our intention is to actually send a letter uh, to the Marine Corps to request them to pursue R1 uh, treatment and reuse on the base. Uh, we have already corresponded formally with some of our congressional delegation advocating for funding uh, to be made available to the, to the military to go to convert to R1 and reduce their uh, freshwater or potable water usage. Um, like Barry mentioned about our main break in East Honolulu, I hope none of the commissioners live in that area that was impacted, uh, but some of the uh, customers at the higher elevations in our boosted water system ran out of water for over a day. Uh, and it's very difficult to to live in, uh, under those conditions, but uh, our integrated system is both, you know, a blessing and a challenge. Um, so I just want to let you know that if necessary, uh, commissioners are, are kind of let you know up front. So if we, you hear I do this, uh, if necessary during an emergency condition, and for us, emergencies are like a few days uh, or up to a week uh, until we get the repair, we actively work 24 hours a day to do the repair. Uh, if necessary, we may need to uh, open up the valve on Haiku Tunnel and allow more of the Haiku Tunnel source to temporarily on a short duration or maybe a few days to flow back into our system uh, when we uh, are in a desperate situation like what we experience in East Honolulu. Just to let you know, you know, our intent is to keep it reduced at 0.3. So that would that would be in communication with our water commission deputy. Uh, yeah, we'll let Kaleo know, uh, and it would be good, uh, Kaleo, if we get a cell phone number for you, uh, because our our emergencies occur whenever, and it's you know 24 hours on weekends. So Kaleo, you know, we might just give you a call and say we're opening it up just to let you know, uh, because we desperately need the water. Temporarily. Mahalo, Barry. Yeah, I will send that over to you via secret email. Uh, so I, my cell number does not get out to the public. Uh, Kaleo, Kaleo, it's going to be uh, shared with uh, a few of us at the highest levels at the BWS. Uh, but uh, we need a way to be able to uh, contact you 24 7. Absolutely. And so if anybody else gets my number, I will know who to look at um, <laughs> if that happens. Um, I, I, I like that, you know, as part of this process, you identify drought scenarios um, and situations like that. And so while just to highlight and remind the commission, you know, um, one day, that's great. The previous submittal, there was conversation about months. And so, you know, we have challenges in implementation. And so I'm grateful to the board to work with them to kind of solve problems as quickly as possible. Um, but also that uh, per the code, we, we, we really need to start developing shortage plans throughout the state in our water management areas. And so because um, all of Oahu except for Waianae is one of those, um, what Ernie mentioned is a shortage, right? In a time of a shortage, what is the communication what is the um, coordination that needs to happen? And so it, it highlights the need for more integration between us as a regulator um, and our, our distributors um, or water operators on in water management areas. So thanks, Ernie. I'll get that to you. Thank you. Let's go to public testimony. We do have public testimony on this. Um, first up is, um, let's see, Kavika Winter. Aloha Chair Case and Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Kobiko Winter, Reserve Manager of the Heia National Estuarine Research Reserve. We continue to be in close communication with our co-management partners who are doing the restoration activities, particularly on the HCDA property uh, managed, uh, managed by Kako Oivi and our partners at Paipaio Heia. Um, I, just to report, there are still no observed increases in water. Water is still very, very low, as we have been reporting, uh, too low to uh, effectively conduct the restoration activities, as we've testified to previously. Um, I just wanted to convey there have been two questions that have come up in the context of uh, ideas about what might be going on. Um, and if staff could provide an answer either now or 
through subsequent correspondence and email or something that would be appreciated. But one of the ideas that has come up is there are perhaps a half a dozen other wells that are not managed by BWS that are in the Ahupa of Heia. Is there a chance that one of them is pumping a lot more water uh, than previously? And it, is there a way that we can understand how much that is and back to that into the equation? Um, and the second question is, you know, there has been a lot of construction work on Haiku Road, um, corresponding to the times that are the water levels were dropped and there's some questions like perhaps maybe the same thing that happened on Kalani and Ole, where they broke into a spring and were dumping spring water into the sewage system. Is that why where there's less water? Is there so the question is how do we follow up on that idea to see if that is an issue that we're facing here? But other than that, I have nothing else. If we could somehow get the answer to those two questions, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Fred Rapoon. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Fred Rapoon. I'm with the Heia National Estuary and Research Reserve. Uh, so thank you, uh, Barry, for your presentation and um, both today and the other day when we met. Um, so my questions, uh, well, I guess my main question um, is that given the switching between well and tunnels or tunnel and wells, um, I assume that might already, with the assumption that that might have an impact on stream flow um, in areas that we're not currently measuring. Um, what is the, the feasibility of understanding the baseline flow for Iole Ka'a stream and the lower reaches of Haiku and Heia stream um, with that switching going on? So I understand that USGS is um, conducting a study of the relationship among those different sources and the streams. Um, but it seems like there might be somewhat of a moving baseline. Um, so, and I, I'm not a hydrologist and so maybe Aaron can comment, but I just wanna make sure that the, the timing of the USGS study and the switching between tunnel and wells um, is gonna um, still allow us to understand um, what we need to understand to, to properly manage. Um, so anyway, that's one question. And the other thing I wanted to bring up was uh, we got to see a presentation from Scott Izuka from USGS, and he has a, a preliminary model that he ran to look at the effect of uh, reducing tunnel withdrawals on groundwater storage. And it was, I'm not sure if I fully understood it, and, I, and I'm sure he has um, refinements to make to that model, uh, but that's something that hasn't come up in our discussions before, and I wonder if um, we could get him to uh, speak about that and, and kind of talk about the details in front of the commission. It, I wonder if the use of that kind of modeling could speed up our study and understanding of the system and get us to um, a point more quickly where we can you know, set an interim in-stream flow standard um, rather than, you know, given the models predictions of how storage will behave and what that would tell us about the relative, the costs and benefits of uh, creating a new bulkhead. So just wanted to put that out there for the commission to consider to, to uh, hear from Scott Izuka. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, questions, commissioners, comments? Um. I was going to ask, Aaron, look like you were going to contribute something. Before I forget, can I answer? <laughs> um, yeah, so um, to go back to Kavika's question about the other wells in the um, Heia, Ahupua, the, uh, or Haiku, um, uh, there are, while there are seven wells drilled historically, um, only three, and um, the Haiku Tunnel, Haiku uh, Well, and Iole K 
Ka'awel are active. Um, the, the DOT has a small well that was built um, for the H3 construction, um, but they don't generally use it. Um, and even when it is used, it's not used for very much. Um, and then the others are all in our database are all abandoned. Um, to uh, comment on um, Fred's question, we, we are working, so Board of Water Supply contract with USGS to study um, well pumpage to model groundwater um, movement and, and recharge and the effects of the tunnel um, on base flow in um, Heku and Ioli uh, streams. Their um, groundwater model was developed for the island and it's a little bit coarser than we would like, but it, they are going to apply it to this area. Um, we did see one preliminary um, <clears throat> um, run of the model, but um, they are still refining it. Um, but we are definitely going to have USGS present, um, you know, after the first sort of phase of their their study, it, they're confident in in its results. They they don't like sharing preliminary stuff very much. They like they like being confident in what they say. Um, so whenever that um, gets, whenever they are at that point, um, we will bring them to the commission. That might be January. Um, I think is kind of the timeline that they were we were kind of throwing out there. Um, separate question, uh, the or separate answer is that they are working on monitoring uh, low flow continuous um, discharge in both Ioleka and Haiku streams at the points in the stream that are closest to the wells, the, the, the not the tunnel, but the wells. And so they are looking at whether pumpage in real time, not, not in real time, but continuously monitored stream flow next to the pumps are affected by the pumps being active or not. Um, they are also looking at points where groundwater is discharging to the stream via seepage runs. And I believe they've already conducted one seepage run. I think they're gonna do maybe four in total. I can't remember the scope of their work, but um, they are identifying uh, reaches that contributes substantially to stream flow. Um, uh, groundwater is contributing substantially to stream flow. Um, and the intersection between the modeling and the field work is going to really allow USGS to conclude to what extent um, the stream flow is impacted by the tunnel. It's the, it's the whole picture, if you will. Um, so the, they're both interrelated. And so it's not that we can skip to a conclusion just because they have a functioning model. Um, we're still looking at the entirety of the system, if you will. Thank you. Other questions, comments, commissioners? Right, if not- I have, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have a response, sure. Okay, go uh, ahead. That's all. Um, if I could, um, just to, Answer Kubika's question about the sewer lines. I did check with the city ENV on you know the the um, distribution of their sewer system in the area. Um, if I could share my screen real quick, um, just kind of um, so they have a you know Kavika talked about Cal Highway where a sewer line was leaking and and it intercepted. Um, underwater flow or groundwater flow into, um, I forget the name of the fish pond, but um, uh, out in Aina Haina. So uh, Kavika Koa asked me about this. Kaikili has a pretty large uh, sewer line here. And whether or not this could be intercepting some of the groundwater flow that would be normally going into the wetland. It's not uh, because um, this is a force main. So they just replaced this and uh, on Haiku Road, I believe. So this portion, they said is a force main. So because there's, there's a dip in the uh, um, Kaikili uh, Road there um, that um, you know, they have to pump the, water, pump the wastewater up to Haiku. And then from here down, it flows with gravity. So um, if this one starts leaking, it's going to leak out. 
because uh, it's under pressure, it's not intercepting. So I hope that answers your question, but I did look at that. Um, uh, so anyway, it's not that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, thank you for this report. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, further updates in the future. Appreciate you all working on it. Thank you very much. All thank right, you, Chair and members. Aloha. Aloha. We're going to move to B3 now. Uh, anybody need a break? Nope. Okay, B3. Sorry, Chair. I thought it was before. <laughs> One second. Somebody, right? No. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. Let me turn my mic. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, or Neil Fuji with the Commission Planning Branch, and uh, I'm going to be giving a quick update on the water audit program that um, CRM is responsible for. Uh, can I share my screen, Ray? Let me try. Oh, perfect. Okay. Let's see. I hope you guys can see. Oh, uh, what can you see? Anything? Okay, you guys see the um. PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry, I can't see it. So yeah, let me turn off my camera. Okay, all right. Um, maybe a little of a change of pace here from um, the other types of briefings, but um, <clears throat> just wanted to um again give an update. I think maybe the past couple of years I've been giving updates, but the the program. Um, the serum water audit program is is underway and going, but we completed the um, the first part uh, or the initial part is the technical assistance and training, uh, and I'll, I'll give you guys a really quick background on that. Some of you might have heard this stuff, and then um, get a little bit into the kind of nuts and bolts of what the wave program is, uh, the training program, and I'll talk about some results. And then uh, a, a summary and, and, you know, where do we go next from here? So um, as you all might know or not know, um, the law, there's a law that passed in 2016 requiring the commission uh, to begin a water audit program. And um, it also requires us to give training and technical assistance. Uh, in the act itself, it divides um, well, it defines public water systems, and then uh, they make a distinction between the county-owned systems and then other systems that uh, serve a population of a thousand or more, a thousand or more population, uh, and uh, those in water management areas. So um, we decided to do the program in, in kind of two phases because the the, the timing and the, the the requirements were different. So the first phase. For the county systems, their audits, validated audits for due July 1st, 2018. And then phase two, which is the other systems, the large capacity, we call them in water management area, uh, are due July 1st, 2020. So we did two phases. Um, and after that, um, you know, annual water audits are due every year to the commission on July 1st. And they also have to be validated, what they call level one validation kind of following the AWWA or the uh, Water Research Foundation uh, standards of validation. So um, we had this you know, big task ahead of us and luckily we were able to get uh, funding so that the act also authorized um, federal funding and, and private funding as well. Uh, and we were lucky enough to partner with the uh, Department of Health and the Hawaii Community Foundation and uh, very generous of them to provide funding to implement our program here. So we couldn't have done it without, without funding. Um, and we ended up um, contracting through uh, water loss experts, water system optimization, and to assist us with the training and technical assistance. Um, 
uh, I want to mention, you know, we talked about water audits and, and what that means. You know, water audits are really just the first step, right? And in developing um, what, what, we, what the industry calls a water loss control program. Um, this little um, image here is kind of kind of an ideal thing, but um, we really want to start getting to saving some water, right? Getting down to the right hand side of this. So just a reminder, as you just if you just do an audit, um, you're not really getting anywhere, right? You're just measuring your system. It's a tool. Um, a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about water balance. Don't want to get too technical. Um, but a water audit, the AWWA water audit is really a water balance. And the, the th two things you got to remember is um, about this is really how much water going into the system and how much water is consumed by the by your customers, right, on the system. So uh, the two key uh, data points are water supplied, which could be wells, stream divergence, or other uh, types of water sources. Um, and then what's your authorized uh, consumption? So there's four types of authorized consumption, and I, I won't get into all of these, but the important ones are the metered ones where you can actually measure them. And then uh, as a process of elimination, figure out what your authorized consumption is, uh, and then you can uh, deduce your water loss from that. And then you can further break that water loss uh, into real and apparent losses and um, with the estimate. So the water audit is really a, um, a process of elimination, I guess you can call it. It's uh, very systematic. And then, um, you know, all, all water is accounted for. So we don't use the term unaccounted for water. Um, we're trying to purge that from the vocabulary of um, water loss control because everything is accounted for. There might be estimates, but um, you know we're supposed to kind of track where everything is going. So um, this is just a, a, a image of the actual water audit software version five from AWWA, which we are currently using. Um, and I talked about the different losses. So there's apparent losses and real losses. Real losses are pretty easy. They're just physical leaks from the system. It could be big breaks surfacing. It could be underground losses that are never detected. It could be seepage losses. So physical water leaking from the system. And then apparent losses could be things like uh, customer metering inaccuracies, um, data handling errors, um, especially if there's you know, manual reads and things. So a lot can go wrong <laughs> uh, with the data. Uh, and, and contribute to apparent losses. So as part of our um, program, we came up with this cool acronym, right? Uh, the Hawaii Wave Water Audit Validation Effort. Um, and that's really describes uh, the training and technical assistance part of, of uh, our, our the commission. So this is where we you know, hired a consultant to help us out with this. So generally it's, um, call it Hawaii Wave. We had, again, we got two phases. So First phase was all the county one systems. Uh, I won't read these to you, but essentially it's going out and, and uh, physically going out into uh, meeting with the, the folks in, in workshops, talking to them, um, explaining uh, the methodology. So we did two sets of in-person workshops and two sets um, of follow-up calls uh, that the contractor did. And, um, and the, the whole uh, purpose of that was training these system operators or system people to uh, learn how to do these water audits and um, kind of a lot of hand-holding, but uh, I think it was fairly successful. Um, this is kind of a time series. It's hard to hard to figure out what's going on here, but the look at the bottom here, it's just kind of what the timeline is. So the law passed um, in, in uh, June 2016. Uh, we got the contract going about February ish um january february and then we you know we all we made it out to uh, last year july 2020 which we um got the first uh validated water audits from these large capacity and water management area systems and you know the contract ended uh december 2020 and then uh, here we are today in september talking about uh, some of our experiences so um, real quick, phase one, again, county owned, 
Um, this is just some details, but the, the one we want to point out is we actually, um, we meaning the contractors, <laughs> trained 32 individuals from the four county water departments. Um, and at that, initially they identified 45 discrete subsystems in the four counties. Um, again, just a little more details on what happened during the, wa the waves. Again, two in-person workshops and then two follow-up, um, detailed follow-up phone calls finally resulting in the inaugural water audits uh, submitted by all the county systems by July 1st, 2018. And since then, they've been sending us uh, annual water audits. Sometimes not on time, but they're sending them. And then, so phase two, large capacity system. So we went back and um, so based on the definitions, uh, uh, we, there's 51 affected uh, PWS, public water systems, as defined um, by Department of Health. Uh, in four counties. And this little graphic, as you probably all know, um, so we looked at all of the systems that are serving estimated population of a thousand or more. And we looked at um, all the systems, all the uh, defined public water system and water management areas. And here's kind of the count here. So Oahu and Maui, I mean, uh, Molokai, Molokai is all water management areas. So every system, uh, Molokai uh, public water system is affected every system on Oahu, except out here, Waianae, which I don't think there are any, uh, are, are affected. Um, you know, and this doesn't include the counties, right? we already took care of those guys. So we went through the same um, wave one, two, three, four, with phase two. And again, uh, here's, a, here's the, the number we wanna point out. Um, there's actually trained 77 individuals who went through the same process, two in-person workshops and two calls. Um, 77 individuals from 48 public water systems. Um, let's see, uh, here's a summary, um, kind of on, on uh, participation and audits received. Uh, just just wanna point out again, you know, we got four years of audits from the county owned systems and uh, currently you got about two years uh, for the phase two or large capacity water management area system. So um, some of this stuff still ongoing. Um, for 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 um, this year's audit, uh, real quick, um, this is might be a little confusing, but at the point I'll point this out is um, this top number is how many systems are affected. The left number is a county-owned system, and the right number is um, the what we call large capacity water management area systems. So phase one, phase two. Um, so county had 45 systems affected across the state. It's four counties. And then for these other systems, there were 49. Um, let's go clockwise. So, um, you know, for these are miles of means for all those 45 systems on the right there, 4,287 miles of means. Um, and then 880 miles of means for these other systems. So clearly they're smaller systems and, and smaller extents. And continuing clockwise, um, this is million gallons a day of real losses, right? So this is um, based on the audits and based on you know the data, however reliable it is, it's not super reliable. Um, uh, 23 million gallons of day of real losses from all of the county systems and then five million gallons a day of real losses. Again, physical leaks, right? Uh, from the, um, the county owned, I mean, not county owned, the water management area, large capacity and keep, we'll keep going. Apparent losses are, I mentioned, you know, these these kind of uh, data handling errors or, or meter inaccuracies. So this results in possibly uh, revenue losses for the utility or the water system if they're, uh, they are a utility. And then um, this value here is uh, dollars um, uh, of lot. So if we value the real and apparent losses, uh, the real losses are valued at variable production costs so what it costs to produce a unit of water. Uh, so, and then the apparent losses are actually valued at customer retail. So what the customer pays. So anyway, without getting into too much detail, this is, this is um, kind of money that the, that's uh, monetized sort of, if you can think about it, water losses, right? So this is a million dollars. So anyway, sorry, that's a lot of busy slide here, but we borrowed a lot of slides from our contractor of giving you an idea of 
um, the size of the system. This is water supplied by, this is about 47, 48 systems. Sorry, it might be hard to read, but um, the, the main point is that, you know, there are a lot of smaller systems for county owned, but then there's a good handful of big ones. And the, the one there all the way on the right is uh, uh, combined systems. So um, because it's integrated, it, it seems like one big system, it's actually a couple few systems that are combined. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is a summary. Um, we talked about um, the size of the systems, miles of main. So this is how much water is supplied in for all of four counties, 215 million gallons a day based on 2018 water audit results. I mean, it fluctuates from year to year, but that's a good, um, Kind of good number there, and then compare this with the these smaller systems, right? Large capacity, they're not really large capacity, but um, you know, look at these numbers as far as you know the magnitudes. Um, you, you get the same shape for a lot of small systems, and then you got a, a handful of big one here, big systems here uh, on the right, and the big one over there is um, Joint Base Pearl Harbor, their large system, and then just to give an idea, uh, kind of what we're talking about, so they. They got about 43 MGD through um, water supply to these uh, other systems. So it's about 25% yeah, of the, yeah, almost exactly 25% if you, you want to think about it that way of water supply. These are just some um, important thing to know here is that um, this is one uh, indicator of um, water losses, a performance indicator. Um, and you see, um, the shapes are kind of the same. You know, you have a lot of systems, you know, real losses are okay. And then you got um, a handful over there on the right with the big um, real losses. Um, the other point I want to make is these other systems, uh, large capacity water management area systems, a lot of them don't have um, customer meters, end use meters. The reason for that is they're not utilities. These are systems like, uh, school campus, hospital campuses, prison, um, et cetera. But they're not utilities, but they got caught in this big net of um, water audit net. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out how we can deal with these. Because if you don't have co consumption meters, it's really hard to tell what's going on right in the system. Anyway, that's a challenge. Um, so these are some common opportunities uh, that came out of both phase one and phase two. Um, the, the, the big ones are data management. You know, we um, nobody really tests their, their source meters, um, which is important. I mentioned the two numbers you wanna pay attention to are your water supply to your source and your consumption meters. And if you don't have those, th those data pretty reliable, then, you know, you're not gonna get good results. So those are some challenges, um, uh, meter testing, both on the source side and customer meter. Also, we discovered or found out, you know, um, sometimes the data can get messed up. I talked about the data handling errors. So um, some things that don't make sense may be explained through getting uh, a deeper look into this billing database, but that's super time consuming. Uh, and a level one validation doesn't really get into that. Um, other opportunities is, uh, you know, controlling the real losses by, uh, managing your pressure um, and also possibly doing some leak detection in some systems where it makes sense. Um, and then, you know, this data management, again, is, is kind of the key. You know, we got to get good data before we can really have confidence in what these audits, uh, the results are, right? So if there's uncertainty in the data going in, you know, you, there's uncertainty in the results. Um, apparent loss recovery. Oh, yeah. So real losses, are, again, are these you know, physical leaks. And then apparent losses are, um, it could be revenue recovery for, for the utilities. So, um, you know, something that, you know, the commission on the water resource management side of things, we really pay attention to this real losses, you know, water waste and efficiency, but it's also important um, for your utilities to, you know, um, have revenue, right? So they can, do the repairs and all those things. So these these both are very important, and hopefully, I think many of the uh, utilities have looked at this as a, a great tool. Um, again, this is a little diagram. We were we're here at the water loss. We got 
two to four years of water audit data is still not super reliable. And we want to, you know, get down here where we start um, addressing some of the, uh, the water loss side of things. Um, so in summary, um, well, we saw this stuff, the water supply to the, the county system and real losses and contrast that with these other uh, <clears throat> water management area, large capacity system. Um, it's almost, you know, 25% if you look at it, right? It's kind of interesting. Um, let's see other, um, oh yeah, okay. So, you know, I mentioned these special cases, non-utilities, like, you know, they're really small, most of these, um, but they use water and we want them to be efficient. So we need to figure out a way to better uh, address that. And, and we're kind of working, uh, putting our heads together internally on how we should do that. They are still required to do water audits, but is, is it some modified audit or or what? So we got to think about that. Um, let's see, I uh, mentioned, you know, water audits are only the first step. So we want to get to the, the water savings, right? Um, two to four years of water audits, according to the experts is, is um, they're still trying to work out the bugs and the data and getting reliable data. So, you know, we're, um, Hopefully these systems are focusing on that. Um, and then we're gonna look for um, partners uh, to implement some of the programs, um, recommendations. So what we wanted to, uh, these are some of our kind of plan next steps. You know, we wanna, uh, we talked about that first bullet there, uh, with the use meters. Um, we're looking to get validator certification for staff because we are the actual doing the validation in house. Uh, American Water Works Association came out with the version six of the water audits. Other states are kind of uh, transitioning over to version six. It's it's same, but it's different. Um, it probably requires some training for that. So we need to think about that if we if we do that. Follow you know keeping up with industry. Um, looking for um, partners and, and champions in the industry um, that are um, um, supportive of of water efficiency. Uh, we were talking about, you know, folks like DOH, Department of Health, Safe Drinking Water Branch, the Rural Water Association, uh, RCAC, uh, Rural Community Assistance Association, where they have circuit riders that go around and assist these small systems, and maybe we can tap into some of their expertise. Um, and then we're looking at, we're looking at, um, well, I'm looking, you know, kind of um, trying to uh, learn from these other states uh, in North North America and, and Canada and in the province. One of the provinces. Look what uh, look at what they're doing, and learn from what um, uh, their situation is. And it's a lot of things in common. I'm finding out. Um, okay, so how do we implement some of these things? So um, you know, it's the we gotta look for we gotta look for resources, right? Look for money. So. Um, there's some opportunities uh, that may or may not fit with what we're trying to do, um, but we are exploring uh, some of this funding opportunities that that um, um, would would you know some of our uh, implementation would qualify for some of these maybe. Um, but we are we're just we're state government right? We're not a utility. We don't sell water, so. Um, you know, maybe putting uh, the utilities in touch, smaller utilities in touch with some of these resources might be helpful. And, okay, so that is kind of a summary, uh, last slide. Um, did anyone have any questions, comments, suggestions? Thank you, Neil. Maybe, uh, can you unshare your screen? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. How's that? That's great. Okay, uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for that report on progress. Um, uh, questions, commissioners? Ms. Kagawa Viviani. Thanks, Neil. Uh, I have a question mostly on who would you say benefited most from this exercise in your experience doing all the workshops? Because I, I presume the utilities do this in house all the time. Um, so, Let's see who benefited. I think the utilities benefited in the water systems because they don't do that. <laughs> they 
they just started. There's a handful that actually were doing um, one, maybe not as comprehensive, and, and a couple that actually are using the AWWA water audit software. Um, but that, that's a very, um, what do you call it? A minority of them, but somewhere. But so the beneficiaries are, uh, the utilities have gotten free training. I was doing the math, you know, if you divide 700,000 by like 100, that's about 7,000 per system spent on, you know, if we were to do it that way. So, or you can, you know, divide it by water. So yeah, however you want to divide it up. So um, utilities benefited. I think we benefited because if we did this with no training, they would come in with all kinds of garbage numbers, <laughs> frankly, and what we've heard in, in other, other places. So I guess I have a follow-up because it looks like the initial funding is over, right? And, and you mentioned seeking other ways to support this. Like how, um, is this something that's now a sea worm kind of regular, uh, like maintaining the training and making sure, you know, with staff turnover, people continue this practice. Is that something that is within sea worms staff's role, like in the future? Is that how it works? Yeah, um, good question. So clearly if we go with like a different version of the software was to change some changes, yes. Um, I would probably think there would be some training required. Now, who's responsible for that and how do we get that done? Um, I mean, we could maybe, staff could, could do training. Um, a lot of other uh, like state, state, they, they really rely on, you know, kind of the, the private sector for this, where there's like these water loss experts, that's all they do, right? So, um, but yes, there's this probably going to be in the future, um, some training required, you know, and even um, possible technical assistance. And that's where the Rural Water Association, Hawaii Rural Water Association may be able to assist because they have circuit riders, uh, RCAC, Rural Community Assistance corporations, same thing. They, they, um, one's funded by EPA, one's funded by USDA Rural Development, I think, and um, Department of Health. So Joanna can add in. They, they, they actually pay these guys to go out and help the small systems, and and mainly it's to make sure we got safe drinking water to drink. But they also have a focus on efficiency. So, uh, yes, going forward, we're gonna need that and you know we may be able to partner we might look for funding hope that answers thank you anything else commissioners all right thank you so much neil really appreciate this all right uh next up is b4 um it's b4 Uh, Neil, can, are you going to introduce item B4 before um, Joy does? Yes. Thing? Yes, I will. I can. Um, let's see. Um, is Joy? Oh, Joy's there. Okay. So, uh, Commissioner's Chair Case, um, Joy Gannon is the uh, manage, manager and, and, um, of the Lanai Water Company, Lanai Water Utilities. And she... Um, they're doing a lot of cool stuff uh, with their system in terms of um, efficiencies, and and they've been a um, uh, adopter of the water audit program, which we talked about. I think they're already doing some of that before we even, um, you know, uh, did the training. But um, she's going to give a little bit uh, about what they're doing on Lanai to um, increase their efficiencies, and they got some cool technology that they're using. Um, to you know, help monitor and manage the water. So uh, with that, Joy Gannon from Lanai Water Company or Lama Lanai. Thanks, Hi, Joy. thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. I really appreciate the invitation to be here. And thanks, Neil, for the introduction. Um, yeah, let me try to share my screen. And if anybody has any questions as we go through, please just let me know. And let's see if this works. 
All right, does everybody see my PowerPoint presentation right now? Yes. Okay, so we'll start from the beginning and hopefully, let's see. Um, what do you, uh, Which street, what, what are you seeing right now? Are you seeing the drinking water systems? We're seeing drinking water systems. It's not in presentation view, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me try. Um, there we go. How about that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. okay. So let me do a quick uh, introduction to the Lanai uh, water systems and then get into some of the uh, actions that we've been taking here on island. Um, and Neil is correct. Uh, we actually worked with uh, the your contractor water system optimization uh, prior to me coming to uh, Pulama Lanai. And so we had had some experience with them and doing water audits. So we got a little bit of a jump start on that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so some drinking, we have two drinking water systems on island, uh, public water system 237 or the Lanai City system. And then we also have public water system 238 or the Manelli water system. Only one of those two, two are considered large capacity uh, pursuant to the water audit program. Uh, in PWS 237, we have three active wells and one that's coming online. Uh, we're in the process of getting that completely permitted right now. We have about three reservoirs totaling about 2.77 million gallons, about 1,400 customers, and we pump about 0.57 million gallons a day. Uh, the PWS 238, we have two wells on that one, about 2 million gallons of storage. Only 135 customers on that one, and we still pump about 0.42 million gallons a day. Uh, the disparity in the number of customers and our almost equal pumping amounts is we have a very large customer on PWS 238. Uh, if you've ever been to Lanai, we have two Four Seasons hotels, and the, lar the large one is down by the beach uh, on PWS 238. We have a separate brackish irrigation system that has uh, three active wells and one that's out of service. Uh, that brackish water is used for all irrigation uh, along the roadsides and the golf course and individual residences in Manelli. We have about 11 miles of water main, about 15 million gallons of storage, only about 48 customers, but one of those is the golf course. And so they average about 0.57 million gallons a day pumping. We also have two R1 facilities. So we are actually the only island that has the ability to recycle 100% of our wastewater. Uh, we have one here in town, and that is used for irrigation, what used to be the golf course here in town. And then we have one down in Manelli, and that is 100% of that is reused on the golf course at, in Manelli. If you're curious about our uh, recycled water systems, uh, please go visit the Voices of the Sea. It's a, an award-winning kind of documentary. We're the first about 10 minutes of that. And if you Google uh, Voices of the Sea Water Reuse, we do a tour of both of those facilities. So uh, when I'm pumping, uh, since we're talking about water conservation, uh, looking, I'm not sure if you guys can see my pointer or not, uh, but here in 2008, Y'all recall what happened in 2008, uh, we had the Great Recession and water use uh, continued going down. Lanai didn't really recover uh, until Mr. Ellison uh, purchased 98% uh, uh, of the island as well as the utility. And beginning around 2012, he started making major investments in the island. Uh, so between 2012 and about 2019, uh, we had uh, both Four Seasons hotels were completely renovated and also a large hydroponics uh, farm uh, went into operation as well as other improvements. So you can see the Great Recession hits around 2008, goes to about 2012. Mr. Ellison begins investing. Uh, the island starts to recover. 
And around 2016, we start really looking at um, water conservation uh, actions. And so you see the water numbers start dropping. It had already started dropping a little bit. Uh, 2017 was the first year we were really focusing on it, and that uh, trend has continued. We actually do uh, water, we examine our water trends um, every 28 days. Uh, so we submit a report to Seaworm every 28 days on our water pumping, water levels, and conductivity or chloride uh, amounts. Uh, so this 2020 was such a, a weird year, I think, across the entire state, but particularly in Lanai, where our two major businesses were shut down for a significant portion of the year. I wanted to show you what 2021 so far during this time period from January to uh, August. So you can see that we're right in line with where we have been in about 2018 and we are in a really extreme drought year. So trend analysis, we're down about 0.5% uh, pumping uh, from the time that Mr. Ellison purchased uh, the utility um, to today. Uh, and that is with some major renovations and properties and water use. So that was accomplished. Uh, some of it was just you know, plain old traditional water line and irrigation improvements. Uh, there was the Mickey Basin water line replacement. And then uh, I think it was began in 2016, we, we started implementing smart irrigation at the Minnelli Golf Course. And so if you go down there, you'll find uh, a weather uh, monitoring station and literally every um, sprinkler is tied into a computer system and you can reduce how much water a certain area gets to 70%, 60% and you control every sprinkler on that, uh, on the golf course. And we also replaced uh, the irrigation system you can see around 2017, 2018. Uh, so the traditional water line and irrigation improvements, it was about, it was well over 60 million gallons a year when you include water line replacement. Uh, as Neil mentioned, we were actually an early adopter of the AWWA audit. We actually started uh, analyzing where we were at using the 2016 data. So by the time we were considered a large capacity uh, water system. And so we were required to submit in 2019. And so we had two good years of doing it on our own with a little bit of help with uh, WSO um, prior to submitting to the state. Um, when we started looking at the 2016 data, we realized that our non-revenue waters was too high. Uh, and there were some really good reasons for that. Our meters were from the late 80s and 90s. Uh, we had an antiquated utility billing system. Uh, we didn't have any real maps of the water lines and the existing meters. And so the meters were being tracked by the meter reader. Um, and we had had four meter readers, meter readers in a period of a little over two years. So we had some real big gaps uh, and problems. And so Neil had mentioned some um, data handling errors. Uh, so between when you're dealing with antiquated meter, meters, uh, old billing systems, and not keeping track of certain things, we had a lot of uh, improvements that we needed to make. So uh, when you're doing the water audit, uh, anytime you have a validity score, so the water audit uh, essentially looks at the volume, the validity, and then basically the, the finance, the financial impacts. And until you get a validity score of 50 or above, you really focus on, okay, what's, what kind of information are you dealing with? Is it good information or is it bad information? You don't really want to start making uh, major improvements until you know that you're dealing with real information. And so we focused on the validity of the water audit for basically the first two years. And that was largely with the water meters and then utility billing. You never really want to do that at the same time, but we really didn't have a choice uh, given where we were at and certain timelines that we had. So we began, we replaced uh, pretty much all the meters on island, we still have a few, but we have switched all the meters except for construction meters to what's called smart meters or advanced uh, meter um, 
advanced meter or AMA. Oh gosh, Let's see what happens when I. Anyways, advanced meter reading. Uh, so these meters, depending on which uh, type we put in, they either uh, read every, they either log how much water has gone through them every 15 minutes or every hour. And then typically about four times a day or, or once a day, depending on which type we installed, uh, it sends a text to a database and logs that information. And uh, so we have real detailed customer use. Um, and we also have what's called eye on water. And that is a customer communication uh, technology. So uh, right now we have about 1,700, a little over 1,700 meters, smart meters on island. Uh, we have quite a few leaks. Uh, this has actually gone down from when we uh, began implementing this program. We started out with about one out of six meters on the island had leaks. Uh, right now we're at about we're less than that. Uh, we all had a, we have an adoption rate of a little under 20 percent. Uh, so not a great adoption rate, but once people do start using it, it's it's highly loved. Uh, we typically mail out about 20 leak letters a month, uh, and every January we, we kind of reset and start all over again. Uh, typically, it's around about 250 leak letters a year that go out to customers. Um, we actually get people sending us little thank you notes on their bills saying, hey, I, I had no idea I had a leak. Thank you for letting us know. So we, they appreciate the notification of the leak. Uh, getting them to sign up for Ion Water is a bit of a technological hurdle. Uh, so we've only had about eight signups in the last six months. Uh, part of the smart meter uh, transition was actually uh, part uh, funding through uh, DLNR um, on water security. So giving you an example of what it looks like from a customer's perspective, this is me, this is my utility uh, meter. Um, so you can see in January, I'm at about uh, 2,000 gallons, and that was fairly consistent until I get to July. And uh, anytime you have a water leak, a leak will pretty much stay the same or get bigger. And you can see, oh my gosh, I have a leak. And so my particular one, I have it set up as a leak alert. And so if I have a leak on my house, it sends me an email on a daily basis saying, hey, you've used water 24 hours a day for, uh, for the last uh, 24 hours. And so this was actually a leak uh, alert that triggered. It was actually a running toilet and it got fixed. But this is what a normal day would look like on my meter. I go to, I'm, there's no water being used in the middle of the night. Uh, during the day, I'm up and about um, cooking and bathing and whatnot, doing laundry. And then in the middle of the night, I have no more water use. So this is actually by the hour. Uh, some of our units actually go in 15 minute in increments, but this one is by the hour. And then on a leak day, you can see every single hour of the day, I have water running through my meter. And so that would trigger a leak alert. Another thing that we found was really useful with the smart meters is working with uh, our large, larger irrigation customers. So this is actually our Brackish roadside irrigation uh, customers in Manelli. You'd seen it had kind of gotten, um, people had kind of gotten complacent. I, would, I don't want to say, yeah, complacent with their water usage. And we implemented this program in 2018. And you can see what happened. Um, it plummeted back down to uh, 2012 um, usage. And largely what had happened is people were irrigating seven days a week. And sometimes those programmable irrigation devices are, are tricky. And so they thought they were irrigating three days a week when in fact they were irrigating seven days a week. And so it's called ion water because people can uh, have a, can see what they're using pretty easily. We estimate, uh, this is probably on the low end, this is probably conservative. Uh, we're estimating about 12 million gallons a year brackish water savings and about 10 million gallons a year in drinking water savings. Uh, it is underutilized. You saw that we only had about 17% of the customers signed up for it. Uh, but once it is adopted by the customers, it's, it's definitely loved. So other things we've been doing for water conservation, we are um, 
one of the water audit uh, fanatics, I guess you might say. We actually do a water audit every single month uh, to see any irregularities in our data. Uh, and then we are going through and submitting that um, annually. And after we're in that process, we also look and say, okay, what can we do to in improve that for the next year? So uh, that's an ongoing activity for us every single month. We've added uh, tracking meters throughout the system. And so not only are our customers uh, have smart meters, we actually have smart meters on our distribution lines. So this is actually a, a smart meter that's measuring all the water that's going down uh, the hill towards the harbor. And so if I have a leak in that line or uh, unusual water use in that line, I get a, a quick notice on it versus uh, a longer period of time so we can try get that a response in a much more timely fashion. We also built a GIS system during the COVID months when things were a little bit quieter. Uh, and that helps us understand where some of those opportunities lie and where should we be replacing water lines? Uh, where could we potentially be adding some more tracking meters and whatnot? And it's also a really good way to communicate um, necessary improvements uh, to the system. Uh, so that's, this is a little bit closer view and every one of those water lines will tell you what the type is, what the size is, what year it was installed and uh, additional information. Uh, with that GIS system, we're actually able to plug it into um, the drone. And so it has a map of where to fly. And this is actually a, a drone uh, flight over a water loop. You can kind of see this is uh, the change in color smack dab in the middle, and that's a water leak out in the field. Um, so that's a new, a new thing that we're doing to try to find those leaks in a more timely manner. We've also redesigned our SCADA system, our supervisory control and data acquisition. We still have a long ways to go on this, but it's a work in progress. So uh, you can see leaks uh, in SCADA by monitoring um, the levels, and we actually have leak alarms set on various tanks. So if there's a higher rate of flow than we would typically get, uh, we, can, we can respond to that more quickly. And the next thing that we're up to right now is we are developing a hydraulic model for the system. And you know, this is definitely a large systems have this, but we're in the process of building that right now. Um, we did develop a water conservation plan in 2019. Uh, actually, it was an update. Uh, turned out 2019 was not the best year to roll out uh, customer engagement, uh, given that 2020 uh, was a very strange year, but we'll be revi revisiting this. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Very impressive. <laughs> um, thank you for that very much. Um, Okay, Mr. Buck. Yeah, Joy, thank you for your actually inspiring presentation. You saw R1, the efficiency, it shows you what you can do. This Kuliana might not be in your Kuliana. We had an update from, uh, I think, little, little Lynn McCrory about a year ago uh, yeah. about some really aggressive conservation efforts on really your sports of water. A any updates on that at all? Again, I understand that this is not, not in your area of, of response. I'm sorry, Mr. Buck, I missed one word when you said sports water, I, I missed that. Yeah, yeah, no, we had a presentation from Lynn McCrory on your forest watershed a conservation plan. Forest, forest. okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, forest, which is, you can be smart on the bottom end, but if you don't have a source of water. So I'm curious, do you have any updates on uh, so I'm not the best person to speak about it, but I can speak uh, in some generalities. Um, and I'm a terrible at pronunciation of certain programs. Uh, I better not even try it. Uh, so there was a large, um, a large, about roughly, I think, one third of the island, uh, don't hold me on the exact number, was put into conservation. And there is a uh, partnership with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Foundation. 
Uh, it's a five-year program, and I think about $10 million in total is being invested, roughly, along with additional um, uh, funds in, in kind, uh, contributions in kind. Uh, so we are in the second year of that uh, five-year program, um, and in, this is in addition to our normal conservation activities. Uh, currently, they are focusing largely on ungulates um, and fencing, and because uh, if you haven't been over on Lanai, we do have a, a, a significant deer, pop, deer problem, and that impacts um, the watershed greatly, not only in uh, erosion, but also in native plants and um, the ability of water to soak into the ground. And so that's right now a large focus for us. Uh, it's also on reef management. So the program is only in the second year, but it's, it's, it's really an exciting project. Um, they're doing some incredible activities with it. And we can certainly send you some more information on that program and be happy to send that to Cleo for distribution if that would be, if you'd be interested. Thank you, that's great. Uh, other questions, comments? Um, uh, Mr. Hannes. Yes, uh, I want to join Mike and, uh, and Suzanne in thanking you for your presentation and uh, letting you know just how impressed we are by some of the innovative measures that you've instituted there. Uh, I agree with Mike that I think the whole story needs to be told and because and, uh, uh, that the, the recharge of uh, your source is vitally important. and and. This island really, and uh, the ownership of this island deserves great credit because you go back to, you were the, one of the first ones to plant the Cook Island pines and so forth to really optimize fog drip capture and so forth. So it has a history of lead, leadership. Uh, and frankly, that's at risk right now uh, with, unless you get your animal uh, population under control, uh, it just seems to be rampant every time uh, we've looked at that. Uh, so encourage that. I want to go back to your leadership, though, and I really appreciate what you've done with golf courses on island. And, I, and I'm just, this is probably as much directed to staff as to you, Joy. Uh, are we kind of up to speed on this? So when other golf courses approach us uh, for water, that we can speak to them, not only in terms of what we can allocate, but what they can do to optimize conservation, optimize reuse, and so forth. So is this is this common among golf course uh, operators or are you kind of in a lead position and a lot of other folks are catching up because we we've got this problem statewide so i see kaleo kind of popped up on my screen uh, kaleo you want to take that or you want to let joy ha handle that joy, joy first. um i i think uh so our golf course is entirely watered by either brackish or r1 sources so it's uh it is it's entirely brackish or, or R1. The technology that's being used um, at the, the golf course is quite frankly phenomenal. It's cutting edge technology uh, for irrigation management. In addition to that tech technology, you've got to match it with the staff's willingness to use that technology. Um, and it, there, there's a learning curve associated with that for sure. Um, and then ownership's willingness to replace leaking pipes. I mean, that was a very expensive pro project, um, but it also had a huge impact for our water use. And I know that, uh, you know, if at some point in time, if anybody would like to see that technology at the golf course, I know that we can do a tours um, and it's, it's really impressive. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, no, Commissioner Hannes, just to kind of piggyback on, on Joy, um, she touched on a bunch of things, but I think um, the commission's move to constantly evaluate um, highest and best use of quality water for the highest and best uses is, is very important. The reevaluation of alternatives, working with DOH, so I'm looking at Joanna, right, on, on reuse and being more strategic and um, pushy um, to, to make sure that that is considered as a practicable alternative and, and getting it to pencil out for costs, right? So Joy mentioned, you know, replacing lines, putting in, you know, the purple pipes, 
those are our cost, real costs. Um, so if we can be proactive and start to, you know, plot that out and get that infrastructure in before even those end uses, that's always great. Um, uh, so we are looking at that statewide, um, any ways that we can create efficiencies and where R1 or reuse is possible um, to, to promote that as an alternative. Um, the Freshwater Council is, is definitely an advocate of that as well, which the commission is a part of and Commissioner Buck is a, mem mem member, a member of as well. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's really important. And then I do want to kind of echo um, me and Joy are professionally go back quite some ways. And so she is the gold star student um, or who we prefer to partner with throughout the state. And the goal here. Uh, as a participant in our water audit program, the idea, idea and intent is we, as a commission and as staff, we constantly, um, or at least I constantly hear um, reasons why we can't do things. And joy is the reason why we can. And so I wanted to give you an example of somebody and an entity that has done that um, with resources, obviously, um, but leadership, right? And it, it comes with leadership. And as she took on leadership there, you can see the data and the results of that leadership. So kudos to Joy and, and, the, and her team and the work that she's doing. Um, but I wanted to give the commissioners an example of a public water system, both, you know, um, groundwater, surface water, I mean, groundwater, brackish water, and reuse on what can be done um, on a system level if, if you take the time and you have the right leadership. So... Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Appreciate that. <clears throat> and I hope the Golf Course Ownership Association or whatever, if it's one exists uh, and resort ownership organizations are getting together to kind of share this information because, I mean, we're often, you know, uh, faced with the need to supply water to support economic opportunity. And uh, often the, the financial investment required to upgrade technology, to kind of create new systems that would spare our natural resources, you know, is thrown out as a reason they can't do it. But okay, so there's a financial capital cost, but there's also a natural capital cost. And we can't have the natural capital keep giving way just because people don't want to make a financial investment. You know, there's got to be a balance to this. And, and you know, there's got to be education as to what they can do. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got to say, I love that uh, uh, real time immediate feedback through water metering on how how you're doing and the ability to, to, to understand immediately when you have a leak uh, so that you can take immediate action. That's that's very cool. Uh, Ms. Kagawa Viviani, Kagawa Viviani, and then Mr. Buck. Thanks. I. Um... Yeah, that was super inspiring. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that these um, kind of your folks' experience can be shared. I'll, I guess I was wondering if you can comment on, you know, your early adopters, but are there lessons that could then be transferable to others that reduce kind of the initial investment because you've learned through, um, through this experience, like what works or how to install more efficiently. And specifically, I was wondering about the, um, well, I'm specifically interested in the tracking meters, like on the distribution lines and how that would work for like a much bigger utility with so many more lines and uh, so many more miles. And um, yeah, if you could speak to that a little. So you have to look, so one of the reasons we did the GIS mapping is uh, the technology, act I didn't get into it, uh, but you can do, um, district meter, it's called district metering. And so you basically have a supply meter and then we actually have a few of these and then all your demand meters below that. And so uh, actually, uh, hold on one second and I can share my screen with you maybe, maybe not. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, so the, the uh, so it's called district metering. Uh, let me try to bring it up real fast. I apologize. Maybe. My computer is acting a little bit slow. Let me try to bring it up. 
Uh, so it does work in larger uh, communities. Uh, you just have to design it uh, appropriately. Um, for lessons learned, I think one of the lessons learned is it's not, um, you're not gonna save water unless you, let me share my screen. Let's see, there we go. So this is actually, uh, we're looking at 40 meters right now. Uh, can you guys see my, uh, my chart? Yep. Okay. So this is actually 40 uh, separate meters. This is a one supply meter that is measuring all my residential uh, brackish meters and roadside irrigation meters. And so uh, you can see I actually do have a little bit of a leak right or, or I'm missing uh, some uh, tracking. Um, so it, you want these number these uh, you want these graphs to be closer together than what they are. Um, actually, I see that my demand meters is 39. So for whatever reason, I'm, I'm missing, I think, three meters. And with those three meters added, I, they should be lined up really closely. Uh, whenever you have a gap, that tells you that, hey, I'm not uh, a, a gap in my information. In this particular case, I didn't have this one planned. So I, I can look at this and say, OK, I'm missing three meters. I need to go find out what happened. Maybe they're not communicating. Uh, but in a normal situation, if during I look at these and I see that gap, I know, hey, I've got a leak in that line. And we've got that actually set up um, in a numerous locations. We have that set up at the community gardens. We have it set up at the Manelli Hotel Irrigation. Uh, okay, we have this throughout uh, different, different spots. Um, lessons learned, it's not an automatic water savings. Uh, you have to work with your customers um, and communicate and educate your customers. So I look at my, that graph and I see, okay, every hour on the hour, that means I've got a leak. Um, a graph makes sense to me. Uh, if you look at with a lot of customers, you say, hey, you use you have a leak. They don't. Well, I was out watering or, you know, uh, my landscaper must have been out watering. And so there's a lot of education that goes hand in hand. Uh, and if you send a leak letter, a lot of customers will respond with, oh, my gosh, you know, I have a leak. And it, it, and it can be only, hey, you need to fix your toilet. Uh, and then you have the auntie who has no ability to fix that toilet. And how do you work with that customer to get them the resources that they need? So it's, it's not just one thing. It's, it's, it's a lot of things. Thanks. Sorry, I have one other question that's unrelated and then that's it. But um, given the Lanai Water Company is the only utility on island and um, DHHL has, uh, I think, parcels that they're looking to develop. What, what um, I guess, how are you, uh, is the current system able to accommodate delivery to future residential homestead development for DHHL? Yeah, so uh, DHHL has a water reservation here on island, I believe all the, all the islands. Uh, we have a sustainable yield of 6 million gallons per day uh, water use. And we are currently pumping about 1.57 million gallons per day. So as far as uh, the bill, with, does the island have that ability to provide uh, water for that reservation? We do. Uh, we develop um, well sites as they're needed and water infrastructure as they're needed. As they're needed. Uh, we are a PUC regulated public utility commission uh, regulated entity. So there's a process that we go through on bringing uh, new customers on, making sure that that doesn't impact our current um, current customers, that, that that does not impact their rates. So essentially, as the development comes on, they pay, they pay for that. But as far as the water availability and the ability to um, develop that, yeah, we have that. Hey, Mr. Mr. Buck, if you had. Yeah, uh, real quickly, Joy, are you using any of your water stewardship uh, activities in your promotion for uh, your the, the hotels? And are you finding any 
sort of aha positive connection in, in trying to promote more people visiting because of your stewardship? I don't think we've gone that, down that road yet. And I think there's an opportunity there, um, particularly with our watershed. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity to come over and visit our watershed, it's, it's spectacular, quite frankly. Um, and it's ex, you know, relatively accessible. Uh, you, when you're down here in the city, you look out and it's, uh, you know, it's pretty dry versus when you're up there in the watershed, it, the, the fog grip is a real thing and you're kind of in the, in the rainforest and it's, it's astounding. And uh, the native habitat, the snails, the birds, it's, it's, it's really cool. So I think that's an opportunity that we really do need to explore. Sure. I, we, we were pre-pandemic planning to try to have a commission meeting on Lanai with site visits. And I was trying to coordinate with Joy to go see the wastewater treatment plant and, and the well sites, et cetera. So maybe it is something that we can work towards. I'm sure the community on island would appreciate us hosting a meeting and a commission meeting on island. We would um, be interested. Yeah, and, and we've been- hey, Kaleo, only make, make sure it, it's overnight, okay? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if we can pull the overnight, but we could definitely do a day trip. Um, the, I, we have been, uh, just as an update, we did present to the Lanai Planning Commission, both Joy and us as a commission, um, kind of as part of our annual um, report back to the Planning Commission and the community of Lanai on you know, new data, new information that we're finding and have some connection to that island. So that's just another update. All right, thank you so much, Joy. It was very, very interesting. Really appreciate all of your, uh, like I said, very cool work on all of this. Thank you, and I will send Kaleo some, some information on our watershed for distribution, and thank you for your opportunity to come and meet with you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, uh, we have one more agenda item, B5. Why don't we take a, yeah, go ahead, Miss five minute break. <laughs> Do you want 10 minutes? Uh, five is good. Thank you. Five minute break. All right.
All right, uh, I think we can proceed with our last agenda item. We have a special guest star for that one. Um, D5, D5. Should I just get started? Uh, Kaleo, let's see if Kaleo he can introduce it, yeah. Yeah, item B5 is an update um, from Department of Health. So our fellow commissioner, Joanna, is gonna be providing that update to the commission uh, related to Red Hill um, and within a specific context um, as agendized. And then um, we're here to answer any questions um, later, but um, I'll get into the after part on what's the next step after the presentation. So go ahead, Joanna, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start sharing my screen and I hope it works well. Share. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. So um, I apologize in advance for wordy slides. Um, I don't have the pretty graphics that everybody else has because this is on the Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage Facility Administrative Order on Consent update. The last update to the commission was done in October of 2020, uh, 2018. So it's been a while since we've had an update. Um, so what I've done is I have um, information on the, on the um, statement of work, which includes these um, different sections. There's eight sections of which these are the primary ones. Um, the most recent uh, submittal has been for the tank upgrade alternative supplement. So I'll get into that also. The first section um, two is the tank inspection repair and maintenance, which we call term. In March, 2020, tank five was brought back to service after that January, 2014 release. Currently, there are four, four tanks undergoing what's called clean inspect and repair process. And the semi-annual tank tightness tests for all active tanks have passed. The tank upgrade alternatives, which we call TUA, um, and the release detection, RD, were submitted together um, in September, 2019. The regulators responded in October, 2020 with the notice of deficiency for the decision documents for both the TUA and the RD. Um, and we've asked them to provide additional information on the Navy selection and justification for the best available practicable technology, which would be called that. Um, so in August 2021, last month, the Navy submitted their to a supplement, um, and you can find it on the website link that is here. And I will be sending um, the PDF to Kaleo to distribute to everybody and to include in the um, documents that are available online. So the regulators are currently reviewing the supplement and we've um, provided some excerpts below, sorry, very small font. Um, from the executive summary on pages seven and eight, the Navy has said, as described in this TUA supplement, the only alternative that meets that requirements today is alternative 1A. The other alternatives do not meet the BAT requirements. The TUA report, TUA decision document, and this supplement demonstrate how the multiple release prevention, detection, and mitigation measures included within alternative 1A are the best technologies that can be employed today to protect the environment, particularly groundwater and drinking water. In section 5.2.1 on page 34 of the supplement, the secondary containment technology that the Navy is currently evaluating is used on tanker ships up to five times the size of Red Hill fuel tanks. The technology is designed to withstand very harsh environments present, present during open ocean transits. The feasibility study is scheduled for completion in 2021, and the results of this effort will be included in the next to a decision document. And from section 5.3.1 on page 36, by July 15, 2045, 
the Navy intends to upgrade all Red Hill tanks with secondary containment, including an inner and outer barrier with an interstitial space that is monitored for releases. If a feasible and reliable secondary containment alternative becomes available and practicable prior to that date, it will be evaluated in a future five-year TUA decision review cycle and implemented if warranted. However, secondary containment is an additional commitment above and beyond the current VAT decision recommendation. The Navy remains committed to the AOC and will implement this and future BAP decisions for all Red Hill fuel tanks by the AOC deadline of 2037. So the supplement is a 500 page document. The executive summary is about, I think it was like 14 pages. So there's a lot of information in it um, and it's taking us a while to go through it and make sure that we have the information that we need from this this supplement. Um, this is a bow tie diagram that they provided for alternative 1A, where they've identified the potential hazard, threats, preventive measures, the event to avoid is the release. Um, they have different recovery controls and the potential consequences of a small, medium, and large release. So another section of the scope of um, scope statement of work is corrosion. Um, in July 2019, the Navy submitted their destructive testing results report. Um, in March 2020, the re regulatory agencies, which are EPA and the Department of Health, um, submitted a dis approval letter which challenged the conclusions of the report and required additional studies for improvements. So in December 2020, the Navy submitted their 5.4 execution plan, which details the 10 additional studies the Navy will perform to improve their efforts to prevent and identify and rem remedy. No, thank you. No, no, no. Sorry, excuse me. Um, any corrosion. Uh, May 2021, regulars provided the Navy with preliminary review and request for revised or supplemental scope of work for Section 5.4 execution plan decision. And last month in August, 2021, the Navy submitted their section 5.4 execution plan decision on need for and scope of modified corrosion and metal fatigue practices, amendment number one. Um, this document is also under review by the uh, regulatory agencies. For the investigation and remediation of releases and groundwater protection and evaluation sections, the Navy submitted um, together in one document um, the investigation and remediation of releases report detailing efforts made to investigate and remediate the January 2014 release and future releases. And they also submitted their groundwater flow model report. Um, the Next groundwater flow modeling working group meeting is tentatively set for next Monday. Um, there are discussions around that date and the agenda items, so um, that date may change. Oh, sorry, wrong way. The groundwater protection monitoring well network um, includes new wells. In 2019, three wells were added, um, Red Hill Monitoring Well 14, 15, and 13. In 2020, wells 12 and 19. And in 2021, 1R, 12A, 16, and 16A. So there are a total of 27 existing monitoring wells, um, and 18 were monitored in the last groundwater monitoring report. There are six wells to be drilled, um, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, and 23 in various locations around Red Hill um, and the surrounding um, properties. Risk assessment is the last section um, of, the, of the scope of work. In November 2019, the Navy submitted their second phase of risk assessment scope of work. Um, the first phase addressed internal risk events, while this next phase will address the internal and external fire and flooding initiating events, seismic initiating events, and other external initiating events. 
In October 2020, the regulators responded with a notice of deficiency and opportunity to cure letter, listing additional work needed for the phase two scope of work. In December 2020, the Navy submitted their phase two scope of work. And on September 2nd of this year, the regulators responded with a notice of deficiencies, section 8.2 risk slash vulnerability assessment phase two scope of work, which was um, on that document that was dated December 23rd, 2020. And in other updates, um, the March 2020, there is a hotel peer release. Um, we are current, the UST program is currently um, following the release response activities. Um, cleanup actions have resulted in the reduction of oil discharge to the surface water by at least two orders of magnitude from 1,058 gallons in May 2021 to about 75 gallons in June 2021. Uh, oil recovery is ongoing on water and land, and it's, the spill is effectively contained with containment booms. Um, the, the, the department is in discussion with the Navy on next steps. On the May 6th release, which happened this year, the investigation and causative research studies are un underway and we are still waiting for um, reports back from the Navy on that information. And on July 16th, 2021, a QO peer release occurred of 110 gallons of fuel, um, which was recovered um, to uh, discharge to surface waters. Okay, and community involvement and meetings. We have the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee, which is known as FTAC. Um, they have increased from annual to semi-annual. The next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, October 28th um, from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, Zoom link and draft agenda will be distributed. Um, at this website link below, you can sign up for an email um, to get more information about the Red Hill updates. Uh, currently, there's over 500 people on that mailing list. Um, previous meetings occurred on October 17, 2019, October 30, 2020, and May 20, 2021. Um, and for the first three quarters of 2021, the Navy provided updates via audio casts due to the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and in 2022, in the first quarter, pending governor approval, the Navy plans to host an in-person meeting or workshop. And these are the websites where you can get more information on the status of the Red Hill AOC. And that's all I have. Stop share. Thank you so much. That You're welcome. Packed full of information. All right, questions, commissioners. We don't have any public testimony in this, so questions, commissioners. Mr. Buck. Yes, uh, first, Joanna, th thank you very much. You know, you walked into a, quite an issue and you are our state representative and always anything the commission or commissioners can do to help you, uh, mm -hmm. be it just provide a, a forum or anything, please let us know. Uh, I'm curious, of how you work with the EPA. Do you both just respond to the actual Navy responses independently or, or did you, you consult beforehand? We consult together because it is a joint effort. Um, so the regulatory agencies are both the EPA and the DOH together. Okay, thank you. And again, we're always just concerned that you guys, they're just, low, you know, the capacity, do you have the capacity to really represent all the state's interests? So again, anything we can do to help or to bring any issues up, please let us know. Thank you. Kagawa Viviani. Okay. Um, thanks for that. I had a sort of a data question. So you were talking about the many groundwater monitoring wells 
I was wondering, you know, does the data go straight to the Navy or do you have independent oversight? Um, You know, do you have separate wells that you can, that are being monitored on DOH or, you know, like an external party side, because there is that distrust of what information is being shared. So the wells are um, monitored by the Navy and the data is provided to the regulatory agencies. Uh, There have been opportunity for split samples so that um, we could check on um, QA and QC of the data. And what's the, like, um, you know, are these, like, how frequently is it being monitored? The the groundwater monitoring program, I believe, is quarterly. Um, It depends on the parameters that they're testing. Chair, if I can add a little bit. Um, I, Ryan is here from our groundwater branch, and sorry. Um, Ryan, as well as Patrick and Bob, um, participate actively in, in the groundwater monitoring um, as we have been permitting these uh, groundwater wells. Um, so I, don't, I wanted to see if Ryan wanted to add anything based on the question you know, asked by Dr. Kagawa Viviani. Um, yeah, between, uh, between me and Patrick and Bob, we are really heavily involved in the uh, um, sort, of, sort of the design phase of, of those wells. And, um, uh, and, and during, especially during construction. Uh, but uh, to be honest, we, we, don't, uh, we don't get too deep involved in the data collection part. Yeah, um, yeah. That's all I got to add. <laughs> okay, anything else, Mr. Hannes? Yeah, th- thank you, Joanna. I appreciate all the good information. Uh, I just can't tell whether we're winning or losing. I mean, uh, it, it, and I, what I can tell this is that is the uh, wheels of justice here are are churning very slowly and you watch the months just go by the years go by is there a way to kind of lay out kind of our strategy in dealing with this kind of over a time frame and as we get updates just have a sense of variance that we're on track as best we can or mm-hmm. we're behind or we're ahead i mean and that's maybe relative to the the presence of risk uh you know i i, I don't know how to do it i just I, you know, I'm, I'm hearing the words, but I'm not sure what they mean in terms of, is this good? I'm looking for my TUA supplemental. Um, they, let's see, which am I opening? And I was going to share it. Okay, wait, hang on. Close, current type. Um, so, let me share this screen again. There we go. Okay. So, this is a 520 page document, <laughs> and it has, um, let's see, I think it was page 84. Okay, so this is page 84 of the document. Let me make it bigger. Um, And this is what they've provided to us to show um, their schedule of um, the budget planning, their request for proposal development, um, the planning, the clean and spec repair of the tank and the return to service. So you can see that um, they have all the tanks listed um, I, I have heard that they are a little bit delayed in their um, term and the, the clean and spec repair process um, because they are just getting, um, learning more about the process and finding out where they need to um, improve on 
what their planning is. Um, is this what you were wanting to see, Commissioner? Uh, I, I suppose um, I'm, I'm just it's trying to absorb this. I'm impressed how you, out of 528 pages, you knew exactly where to go. So that's, <laughs> that's comforting. Uh, and I'm already mis noting I don't see tank one here <laughs> as I look at all the tanks. But, right. but let's put that aside for a minute. I, I, I think, yeah, th if this is what we believe is a best case or an acceptable case, mm -hmm. then then you know there's a lot of activity that go that's behind this and it's good to hear about the activity and so forth but ultimately if this is what we want to see a whole bunch of tanks in the green position because they've been uh, uh, dealt with and mitigated and and uh, and they're green then it, that's something we can track right uh, and, and we can put the the activity that you report on in the context of what we're what we're looking for as outcome. Right. Right. Um, and we are looking to make sure that they maintain the safe drinking water of the um, systems and the people. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If I can, um, Commissioner Hannes, you know, getting to that, um, you know, in, in talking with Joanna, um, I as well as chair and some staff sit on the field tank advisory committee uh, that's now meeting biannually, right? Um, so that's good. Um, but a suggestion was made that, you know, if to the extent that the you folks as the commissioners of water resource management um, have questions for the Navy or wanna direct these, you know, comments, um, there's that opportunity to participate. We checked with the you know, AGs on that, and we can we can make that available. You can be a participant in that process, um, and would would encourage it. So, some of your policy questions or questions on larger approach can be addressed directly by the Navy. Um, and as a regulator, you know, we as well as Department of Health play an active role in protecting our water resources. So, um, we we try to hold that space uh, and have that, you know ask hard questions and good questions. Um, and our groundwater team, you know, really is trying to, you know, get answers to some questions that we've been asking, but you know, it, it sometimes works better if it comes straight from the commission and not through, through staff. And so I just wanted to put that out there. If you, if any of you want to attend the October 20th meeting, you know, let us know uh, and we can advise the uh, facilitators and department of health um, of your attendance. So that way, um, it's noted for the Navy and other participants. Just as another option to continuously engage, check in, um, uh, and monitor the situation in this area. Right, and I, I can't speak for other commissioners, but this is the kind of tool that would, I think, help me to kind of understand whether we there's a need to express a point and what that point should be, uh, because when we see you know, again, in my simplified brain, okay, I want to see all those tanks green, you know, and here's the schedule that we've agreed upon, and you're either ahead or behind. Or maybe some other something happened that necessitated a change in that schedule to move a tank that was going to be dealt with later. Now earlier, okay, tell, tell us that so we can track that. And when you're off track, you know, and this is just speaking from a management experience standpoint, I mean, this is how you know you're off track. You know that people can report activity, activity, activity that leads you nowhere. Uh, you know, or they can say this is the critical path, and we're going to stay on the critical path, and we're going to explain when we're off. And maybe occasionally there's good news, and you're ahead, which is which is, would be wonderful. Aurora, oh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is Paul. Um, I was a minute late getting back and I, I obvious question for me, uh, which I uh, didn't have the benefit of, and I'm sure Joanna addressed it, um, was uh, the availability of this report and additional details for us. By the way, thank you very much for this presentation, Joanna, and for your work. Uh, this is, I regard this as, as really vital to the commission and our efforts at protecting the drinking water resource. And uh, it's, uh, the potential for uh, 
damage, uh, lasting damage is extreme, uh, in my opinion. But yeah, can we get these data, uh, this report? Is it available to us? And, and is it yes. conclusive, exhaustive in terms of the detail? <laughs> so the supplement is 520 pages. Right. Um, the link is in the PDF that I will be sending to um, Kaleo to send to everybody. Wonderful. And also to post on the website. Um, just to let you know, I did not put this, this presentation together. It was all the team the Red Hill team. And so I appreciate all the work that they've done for us and they continue to do and keep track of everything. Well, thank you, Joanna. I look forward to reading the report. Very interested in this situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a question, but I thought Commissioner Katayama also, uh, did, were you gonna say something? Hi. Joanna, thank, thank you for the presentation. And boy, that's a lot of things to absorb and sort of categorize. And I guess from a simplistic point of view or, or you know, from a linear point of view is one, first question, is alternative A1 sort of the consensus way everybody agrees is the cost benefit approach to sort of you know, fixing this problem? The Navy has proposed 1A as that at this time. Um, the regulating agencies are still reviewing that decision. And to that timeline chart that you presented, what's driving that? It, it seems like it's a little long for something that uh, has a pretty severe impact on the population. So that, that um, schedule is their clean inspect repair schedule. Um, it's not the schedule to bring the tanks to, into BAT, whatever BAT is determined to be. So they're ensuring that they are making, that the tanks are in good condition to continue until they can get into BAT is what my understanding is. So what's protecting the groundwater from contamination. I mean, that would, wouldn't that be disaster? Yes, so the, the clean inspect repair process, the tank inspect um, repair maintenance term that they currently do, they have a system of systems to monitor the um, fuel going in and out of the tanks. So they, they say that this is a the Navy says that this is how they are protecting the groundwater at this time. Um, and we are still evaluating on what we, we the regulating agencies, um, believe that is enough. Is there a backup solution in, in the event that the Navy is not all that proficient in containing their fuel? Um, one of the risk um, items is to have a water treatment facility um, for the Red Hill shaft area. Um, they have they have indicated that they have that option, but they have not given us an update on whether they would be able to move forward on that with all the um, the funding requirements. It sounds like you have a lot of headwind. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Joanna. Keep at it. <laughs> All right. Joanna, it's just a comment because I know the previous health director opined that if you look at the economics, it would be cheaper now just to totally relocate those tanks rather than spending all this money and delaying this time frame out. But uh, I guess that wasn't part of the original agreement. But uh, I know uh, uh, Mr. Anderson, when he was on board, that really was his, his focus. He was thinking that was the, the best way to go ahead. But that's not the path that we're following. Um, it's not out of it's not out of the box yet. We it's still one of the things under consideration. 
Joanna, this is Paul again. Um, going back into the late 80s and 90s when EPA shut down most underground storage tanks, um, large or small, um, and, and certainly these are very, very large tanks, um, and forced uh, reconstruction, uh, either on a double wall inspected and um, alarmed basis or uh, an above moving to an above ground storage tank. And that my recollection is having watched that for, for years um, was that there were not acceptable alternatives of a single wall underground nature. Um, is that true? Is that your recollection? And if so, why is the Navy not, as Mike said, trying to entertain more conventional alternatives for reconstruction, fixing this problem, et cetera? So, so yeah, so um, sorry, I, I'm not totally familiar with all that UST upgrades back then, um, mm -hmm. but for the, um, the upgrades at Red Hill, that was an option that was proposed um, in their original um, review of options right. for the for the facility. Um, I don't know why it's not continued as an option. I'll have to go back and check with the team. Um, but like I said, it's everything is still up. Um, and possible until we actually figure out what we want them to do. Thank you. And, and Paul, the, the military is exempted from those regulations. I figured that one out. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, Joanna, I had a um, technical sort of question, which is, you know, we have all these like serial spills and at some point, I mean, if all what's contained, you know, is separating it from our resources is a, you know, the concrete flooring. I don't know what the substrates like. Like how it doesn't seem to line up with the twenty forty five or twenty thirty seven timeline, and and so I was wondering who is actually assessing what risk is and. and Probabilities. Is that within DOH? Is that EPA? Is it Port of Water Supply? Is it like who's actually? Is it so a volunteer the, group of, of folks? <laughs> so the risk assessment evaluation is being conducted by the EPA and DOH, um, and we are reviewing their submittal for um, Section 8. And so is that information like on the FTAC? I, I believe it is on either the Red Hill, either of the three agencies, Red Hill um, webpage. I'm not sure which one, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? All right, uh, with that, that brings us to the end of our meeting. Thank you so much, Joanna, for all of that work. Uh, thank really you amount of work very complicated um good team yeah all right so that brings us to the end of this meeting and commissioners i think we have a, a different proceed proceeding coming up so we'll log off here and um we'll um